Good evening, everybody. We'd like to call to order the June 27th, 2023 meeting of the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors. If we could begin with a roll call, please. Supervisor Koenig? Here. Cummings? Here. Hernandez? Here. McPherson? Here. And Fred? Here. Uh, we're going to begin with a moment of silence, I believe, Supervisor McPherson. Right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to dedicate a moment of silence to Josh Wolf. Uh, the district engineer for the San Andreas Valley Water District, uh, who passed away in uh, early June uh, to, due to a medical emergency at the age of 52. Uh, he was a highly respected engineer in charge of helping the San Andreas Valley Water District uh, rebuild its infrastructure after the CZU fire. And they made many, many cooperative arrangements with other district uh, or area agencies as well, including Big Basin. Um, our, th our, our thoughts with his family and friends, uh, Josh Wolf was a special person who uh, uh, really did a tremendous job for what he did for the San Runs Valley Water District. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Cummings. I'd also like to dedicate the moment of silence to Kit O'Leary. Um, yesterday, we found out that he had, had a, come down with a medical emergency about a week ago, and then yesterday passed away and um, was pretty sudden for many people in the community. He was a West Side resident, uh, born and raised in Santa Cruz, who was um, a familiar face throughout the community and was uh, cared about deeply by many people. And so our condolences go out to uh, his family and friends. All right, thank you. If you'll join us in a moment of silence and then the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Please stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States and to the republic for which it stands. But one day, there are indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Mr. Foster, are there any changes to today's agenda? Uh, yes, we have a number of changes on the re regular agenda um, item 13. There's additional materials. There's a revised memo packet pages 145 and 146. Paragraph one should read the uh, FY 23, 24 proposed rate for CSA 48 and CSA 4 reflects the allowed consumer price index increase of 5.6% and a 4% maximum increase for CSA 48 2020. Background on page three, sentence two should read the CSA 48 2020 special benefit assessment base rate. Nice to meet you. Welcome, welcome. 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 Welcome, Recommended action number two should read approve amendment to agreement contract 24C4572 with Rincon Consultants, increasing compensation by 60,829 for a not to exceed amount, exceed amount of 259,341 for consultant support and implementation of the 2022 climate action and adaptation plan and quantification of greenhouse gas reduction targets. On item 51, there's additional materials, revised memo patch, packet page 632, which is replaced. The analysis page paragraph 22, sentence four should read, this amendment will increase the current contract amount of 198,512 by 60,829 for a total contract amount of 259,341. There's also revised attachment A, packet pages 634, 645, and 649 is replaced. On item number 84, there's additional materials. Revised memo packet page 1100 to 1101 is replaced. Analysis packet paragraph four is added. Revised attachment A, packet pages 1102 and 1103 are replaced. Packet pages 1104 through 1109 are deleted. That concludes the changes to today's agenda. Thank you, Mr. Blasios. Are there uh, any items that board members would like to remove from the consent to the regular agenda? Okay, seeing none, uh, we'll open this up for public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the community to address us on items that are not on today's agenda or within the purview of the Board of Supervisors. Also an opportunity for you to make 
uh, comments on the consent agenda or the regular agenda if you can't stay as well as the closed session agenda if you can't stay. Please feel free to step forward if you'd like to speak during public comment. Good morning. Yeah, good morning. My name is James Hewitt, and I would have not imagined that I'd be the first one to speak for public comments. Uh, so, some quotes. Clot shot, clot shot creature outlives the... Undertaker reports blood clots, moving fingers, and can't be killed, even in formaldehyde. Carrie Madej reports creature lifted itself off microscope. Numerous startling theories that suggest a new public health horror has only just begun. That information is more than 18 months old. Another quote, woman coughing and throwing up synthetic biological creatures. She feels them under her skin and in her brain. She sees them in her stool too. Watch the creature wiggle in astounding footpaths, June 8th, 2022. You know, if I had 15 minutes, I could go over outlines of the basic 17 remedies. The primary one is something that every human being creates through their own urine that produces stem cells. I don't know half of you as well as I would like, and I like less than half of you as well as you deserve. That's Bilbo Baggins at his 111th birthday. So, you know, it's really interesting. You guys are just kind of following the opulent parasite class. Almost everything you guys do is 180 degree X of the truth. It's been explained to me that a circle is 360 degrees. More than 20 years ago, I got a personalized plate, 180DEGX. So, you know, I'm here as a witness. I'm really surprised I'm the first one to speak. Thanks. Thank you. Good morning and welcome. Good morning. As you all know, I am a domestic violence victim here in Santa Cruz County, and I've worn my pink shoes um, inspired by Santa Cruz County Bank Chief Banking Officer John Sisk, who was seen in the Santa Cruz Sentinel victim mocking um, in support by Monarch Services, who thought it would be really funny for men to walk around and try to identify what it's like to bring awareness to domestic violence. And this is absolutely shameful and disgraceful, and many of us in the um, domestic violence community are really sad, traumatized, and heartbroken by this stunt. Um, I see that consent I agenda item 50 is asking for money for violence against women, and nothing is working in this county. I've been here since January. Um, the public comment uh, to this shocking uh, stunt is, here's one from Belgium. The video of Maya and Sebastian's kidnapping was shocking to watch. The kidnapping of Brooke Murdoch was even more gruesome. A gang of police officers forcing a 13-year-old girl onto the concrete and cuffing her hands and feet is unthinkable in my country. These are outright acts of torture. That all of this happening with the approval of a court is deeply disturbing. The excessive violence of a government against women and girls is a sign of a totally diseased society. The images of the violence of these children endured are burned in my brain. I have a very hard time with that. It has given me sleepless nights. Now I feel a sense of powerlessness. As far as I can tell, there isn't much empathy from most of the US population. The fact that men hold a playful action by walking around in typical women's shoes confirms the conscious maintenance of inequality between men and women. Ridiculous and sad at the same time, I sincerely hope that your struggle will bring about change. That a 13-year-old girl is publicly tortured at the behest of and in the presence of her own father is the most scandalous thing that has come here from America. Stop this. All support from Belgium. These men would have been better off spending time in Sheriff Hart's jail and during an unlawful strip search like I did where I had to get naked and bend over and show my genitals when I had no, there was never a thought that I was hiding contraband. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning. Uh, Debbie Hinkey from Bonnie Doon. And the board has changed since the last time I've been here. Welcome to you new ones. Um, I don't think you get paid enough. Seriously, looking at this agenda was overwhelming. Uh, I have two comments to make. One is item 37, and I can't stay, so that's why I'm here. The sale of property appears to be in stark contrast to the Assembly Bill 309 that's being supported by you. 
uh, for the Housing Authority for enacting social housing for California Housing Authority. Um, I don't understand why you're trying to sell property. Uh, it seems to me you would make more money leasing the property and having people build low-income housing. I currently am a caregiver for one um, of the patients through in home support services, retired RN, um, and she is currently without housing and she is disabled. Um, item 46, this one is why I'm here. This is your um, seven and a half million dollar budget for CAL FIRE. I went through it last night with a fine tooth and comb. What I've discovered is that 33% of CAL FIRE is chiefs or captains. There's only 67% which are firefighters and different engineers. Um, when I attended the last FDAC meeting, there's a $12 million surplus in their budget, and yet you have increased illegally the assessments for CSA 48. Currently, I am paying at least a quarter of my property taxes and all these assessments, which I find highly objectionable. There was a reason Prop 13 was passed, and that's for people like me who, as you get older, don't have to pay all the assessments and keep adding and adding and adding on. Thank you, Ms. Um, Henke. If you could just finish up here. Yeah, so 4.6, or 5.6, sorry, is over the limit that was proposed to us for the CSA assessment. And I'm tempted to withdraw, uh, to put yes. before the people. Thank you, and Ms. Henke, that, that error was noted. That was corrected in the, uh, right into the record by Mr. Palacios. The resolution had the correct number. The board report had the incorrect number. It is below 5%, so I appreciate the comment. Okay, though. but thank 7 million surplus yes. sitting in their bank account. But thank you. Good morning, council member, welcome. Good morning. Hi, Chair Friend, Honorable Supervisors. Uh, my name is Kristen Brown, and as mentioned, some of you might know me as the council member from the city of Capitola, but I am here before you today as a nine-year board member and treasurer for the Community Action Board of Santa Cruz County, or CAB. CAB's mission is to partner with the community to eliminate poverty and create social change through advocacy and essential services. We envision a thriving, equitable, and diverse community that is free from poverty and injustice. The Community Action Board recently completed our two-year Community Action Plan, which outlines how CAB will use our resources to address poverty. In engaging our community during the creation of this plan, we heard from over 500 voices through surveys of low-income community members, focus groups, and town hall public meetings. Within these interactions, we learned some important things about our community that I'd like to share with you today. 30% of our low income survey participants reported an annual income of less than $5,000 a year. 59% said their pay was too low to cover their cost of living and 52% said their income was not high enough to afford food. I think it's also important for you to know that when asked about our most valuable community assets and resources, Community organizations and government programs were in the top four. With that in mind, we thank you for your support of the Community Action Board and our clients. A report with additional information from our Community Action Plan is forthcoming and will be sent to you in the very near future. In the meantime, again, we thank you for the support of our community. Please don't hesitate to reach out if I can provide any additional information about the Community Action Board and its programs to fight poverty and create social change. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome back. Good morning, supervisors, and thank you for your service. Uh, my name is Shalaka Banis. I have, uh, well, I love Santa Cruz, and I have the pleasure of serving as the chair of the Mental Health Advisory Board for about a decade now. Um, when you have a program that's understaffed and under-supported, uh, you have a lot of the leaders of it just trying to see how to keep the program going. If you have a ship, and it's under maintenance, you start having leaks, you have people spending more time, how do you bail the ship out and how do you keep it going versus stepping back and saying, hey, maybe this isn't the right way to do it. Is there another way to do it? Um, I really wanna thank the uh, Behavioral Health Services and the uh, working closely with the Mental Health Advisory Board in looking at a new way to deal with crises. And one of the <laughs> ways we're looking at is called Crisis Now. It will be on the agenda for later today. 
but really appreciate the close collaborative that we've had with Med, uh, Behavioral Health Services with the Mental Health Advisory Board. So thank you very much. I want to say that. And Manu, the picture with your child in front of the park that's going to be renovated is, I love it. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you for your work. Good morning. Welcome. Hi. Um Hello, my name is Kirsten Jewell, um, and my uh, indigenous brothers and sisters have taught me that when you <clears throat> come into the home of others, you bring a gift. And so I baked you all fresh uh, sourdough bread as a symbol of solidarity, because if we are going to be um, able to solve the mental health crisis that we have in our county, we're really gonna have to work together. We're gonna have to listen to each other. We're gonna have to listen to the, um, the needs of our workers and the needs of our people. And if we are coming into this um, juncture with a attitude of us versus them, I just don't see us being able to uh, be able to come to a conclusion that works for everyone. Um, so like I said, I'm Kirsten Jewell. I've worked for the County of Santa Cruz for 10 years. I worked in child welfare. I also worked in the jail, in the reentry team. And for the last four years, I've um, worked for HPHP and Emmeline in the Integrated Behavioral Health Program as a therapist. We are currently in a crisis at the county, and today I'm, I'm coming to ask for a raise. Um, I put together some data, and we, the Santa Cruz County, is making about 35% less than our neighboring counties. We have 41 open positions in the licensed behavioral health group. We only have one um, licensed, per, licensed professional that is doing all of the 5150s for the MERT and MERTI team. Um, we are not, people are waiting for a very long time in order to re receive services. And my um, recommendation is that if we really want to solve this problem of having so many openings in our in our county, we need to offer a, com a competitive wage. A uh, 32 hour work week I think would be helpful. And also we need to be offering more part-time jobs. People that are working um, as licensed up. professionals are no longer wanting to work 40 hours. And we wanna be with our family and we need to provide options so that people will come and work for us. We thank need to you. be a desire. No, if you could just, fin thank you. If you could make sure you finish up. Thank you for sharing that. Good morning, welcome. Good morning, thank you. I'm here to speak with you, the Board of Supervisors, about the conditions the county clinic staff are operating under, conditions which are also described in the recent grand jury report. I think if you knew our challenges, you would wanna lead change and make sure we have the resources to do our jobs. My name is Cassie and I'm a public health nurse at the Homeless Persons Health Project, HPHP, where our county clinic serving the homeless population. I've heard the homelessness is one of the biggest issues for voters, yet our clinic is just as under-resourced as our patients. In our broken healthcare system, we are often the only voice advocating for our patients. When the hospitals and mental health providers and community programs fail, we are the safety net to the safety net. Unfortunately, this has left us stressed out, burnt out, and unable to provide our patients the healthcare they deserve. Here are three of the most pressing concerns we're dealing with at HPHP. One, we're operating out of a tiny rundown clinic. Yesterday, there was toilet water from the shelter upstairs leaking into our office again. We only have three exam rooms, and other county clinics have around 20 each. This makes it challenging to provide dignified, private, and comfortable health care. Our administrative staff have identified several acceptable alternative locations for our clinic, and county executive management has declined each proposal. There aren't enough, or number two, there aren't enough local substance use treatment beds, and we are being hit with the full weight of the fentanyl crisis. Our patients tragically die preventable deaths waiting for treatment. Our staff has performed 18 emergency overdose reversals in the past six months in a one block radius of the clinic on Coral Street. This often means providing full CPR with chest compressions and rescue breathing. And number three, in 2023, two of our six full-time RNs have reduced their hours in, to part-time due to the stress of this crisis. We have positions open in the county, but no one is applying. There's literally no one on the list. We're always hearing about the grant money flowing into the county to alleviate, alleviate homelessness, but we don't see it at the clinic. Our working conditions are not acceptable. To resolve this lack of equity, we are asking you to address the concerns of the voters and take care of the people who take care of the people by facilitating the following. A larger updated clinic where we can see patients privately and safely, wages to recruit and retrain nurses who can afford to live in Santa Cruz County. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Good morning, welcome.
Good morning, supervisors. My name is Suzanne Sampson. I work as a public health nurse at HPHP. I've been at the county for about 10 years. As my coworker Cassie said, we outgrew our clinic space several years ago. We cannot provide equitable services with only three exam rooms and multiple vacancies in both medical and behavioral health providers. And although we do outreach and see people in the field, there's only so much medical care we can provide in a camp. We need a full, fully functioning clinic with adequate space and staffing. As as it is, we are often checking vital signs, providing wound care, foot care, and other services in our waiting room on a daily basis. This would not be acceptable at any other medical clinic. Our patients have to wait hours on standby if they need to be seen immediately. Some of our therapists only have enough room in their schedules to see patients once a month. This is an issue of both equity and fiscal responsibility. When pe people cannot access timely care, they get sicker and end up in the hospital or in crisis stabilization for entirely preventable issues, which costs everyone. It is a full-time job being homeless and doing the basic tasks that you and I take for granted every day, such as accessing food, shelter, shower. Um, all while facing the stigma of living on the street. We need to make services accessible now. Cassie also mentioned that our staff is burned out. I'm one of the nurses that has reduced my hours in order to attend to my own physical and mental health, and no one has been hired to cover these hours. We need solutions like the 32 hour work week and part-time positions so that we can hire people and avoid burnout. I cannot see myself continuing to work at this job for another 10 years under these conditions. It took me a long time to build the relationships I have with our patients and other service providers, and I do not want to leave my job. But frankly, it's maddening to live and work in such an affluent community that cannot seem to find the political will to provide for the most basic needs for everyone. You are the ones that can change this. Thanks. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome back. Good morning. My name is Becky Steinbrunner. I'm a resident of rural uh, Santa Cruz County. I want to again bring to your attention that your website calendar is still broken. And, um, but I do see that you've uh, added a, a transcript of all the budget hearings on those website pages, if you can find them. I ask that you make a tutorial for the public to navigate the budget this year. Um, so, uh, Supervisor Cummings was given some help to enable him to be able to look at that and I ask that you do the same for the public in a video. I'm here to speak about uh, item number 13, I cannot stay. I am happy to see that the error in the 4% cap of CSA 48 2020 increase was was caught um, and please make sure that that happens. I also want to say that I think item 46, the CAL FIRE budget, uh, uh, CAL FIRE contract should have been pulled. This is a very large uh, amount and I attended the the FDAC, the Fire Department Advisory Commission meeting when it was presented to them. It was shocking. Um, the smoke and mirrors tactics that were used to claim savings by reducing the Amador months from uh, seven to five. That's all on paper. <laughs> and to increase it by $900,000 to increase six engineers staff positions that were supposed to be paid for by CSA 48 2020. That's what we were told when, when that was approved. And now we're being uh, increased by $900,000 to do that very thing. That's not acceptable. I would like to see a dedicated battalion chief to training the volunteers from the ranks of the volunteers and pay them. They understand. And uh, I think you have the ability to change the allocation Thank percentage you. of. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Steinbrenner. Thank you for your comments. Good morning, Dr. Strudley. Welcome back. Good morning, Chair Friend, members of the board. I'm here to uh, respectfully request that item 96 on the consent agenda be pulled and heard in a regular open session. Um, that item requests withdrawal of the Zone 7A funds from its cost sharing agreement with the Paha Regional Flood Management Agency, of which I'm here on behalf as its executive director. Um, I'm not here to contest 
the importance of the projects that Zone 7A is seeking to address. In fact, I'm very uh, sympathetic to the widespread needs that have become apparent from the prolific rainfall that has occurred this year. But this is not a constructive way and would drastically underfund the Paha Regional Flood Management Agency's capabilities in advancing other important regionally significant flood risk reduction projects. So if it is heard um, after it's being pulled, I'm here to provide constructive recommendations and be helpful in that discussion. And Dr. Not Dr. Stradley, the item was not pulled, so if you could just go ahead and share uh, your thoughts, that'd be ideal. Okay. Um, my, item, my discussion items are very simple, is that the notion of Zone 7A withdrawing from its cost-sharing agreement is not conducive to solving the problems in the Pajaro Valley area in terms of their flood risk reduction. And that constitutes a large part of the capital reserve program of the Pajaro Regional Flood Management Agency. And our capabilities would be limited should that funding go away. And I'll just end there and thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Strudley. Good morning and welcome. Good morning. Hi, my name is Megan Carroll. Um, I'm the volunteer coordinator at the Santa Cruz County Animal Shelter. Um, I know a couple of you have recently visited the shelter, so it's nice to see you here. Um, I wanted to bring to everyone's attention that we at the shelter are looking for more staffing and resources to support our staff. We are intaking a lot of animals. We have understaffing issues um, that are really impacting the workload. And I, as the county is one of our members, on our JPA board, I wanted to bring it to your attention. Um, I also wanted, because this is the volunteer appreciation, I wanted to say thank you to all the volunteers who come to the shelter because they support us, especially when we're understaffed, like we are right now. Um, they provide essential services for our animals and our staff. And I also want to show my support and solidarity to all the behavioral health um, people here for SEIU because I know that we work with a lot of people who are unhoused and who are in crisis and their animals come to us and they are essential to this community and I really support them as another person who works with people who have behavioral health issues. So thank you so much and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Good morning, council member. Welcome. Thank you, and uh, it's good to see everyone. My name is Ari Parker. I'm a councilwoman from Watsonville, District 7. I'm also uh, here today as a member of the Board of Directors for PERFSMA, which is the Paro Valley uh, Flood Management Agency, and I'd like to speak to um, item number 96 um, in regards to it being on the consent agenda. And if I understood that it could not be, it wasn't pulled, so there's no way to go back and actually do that. So I know I sent a letter, it was kind of late, so I don't know if you saw it, so I'd like to enter some of that information in there that um, I feel, as did at least uh, the majority of our board, feel that this was a, a, a crippling moment for um, a, an infant agency to have monies pulled right at this time. Um, withdrawing funds is you know, not consistent with the notion of a partnership embodied by the formation of our PERFMA JPA. We should be working to establish alternative funding sources for the drainage projects um, that Zone 7A seeks to complete without gutting PERFMA's capital reserve fund. So the residents of Watsonville, and especially in my district and the Paro Valley surrounding the Paro River, uh, voted to increase their yearly property taxes uh, by hundreds of dollars in perpetuity to support PERFSMA mission to complete the Paro River levy project. And soon the Army Corps of Engineers will be signing a construction agreement based on the local match funding and uh, that was committed to by Zone 7A and other local agencies. So please do not put this project uh, and the decades of work by so many in our federal, state, and local governments in jeopardy. Uh, don't abandon the promises that were made to the people of the Paro Valley and especially disaster-ridden Paro. And uh, I thank you for reconsidering item number 96. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Good morning, welcome. Good morning, supervisors. Uh, my name is Andrea Tileo, and I'm with the Family Services Agency of the Central Coast. I'm the director for Suicide Prevention Services, and we are responsible for answering the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. Uh, last year, we answered about 3,000 calls, and I look, just local calls coming in. This year, we expect 3,500 calls coming into the lifeline. 
we've spent the last year and a half to two years building a very solid base in terms of infrastructure, technology, and a workforce to be answer those, to answer those lines. Currently, we have 22 responders on our lines. We have another five uh, support staff. And I'm here just to, kind of, to support the crisis now model that we're going to talk about. I think it's item number 10 in terms of the overall kind of model, but also really to advocate for long-term sustained funding for mobile crisis units, not in a grant, not under AB 988, but long-term sustained funding that's part of your ongoing budget within the county. Um, so anyway, that's why I'm here. I'm supporting that Crisis Now model, and I really appreciate your time and your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you for your work. <laughs> Good morning, welcome. Good morning, Lee Brokaw, board member, ACLU, Santa Cruz County, chairman of the Police Accountability and Transparency Committee. Uh, to date, crisis response has fallen to law enforcement who work from a command and control model. That doesn't work for people in crisis. Um, they don't even understand the words that are being commanded to them. And it ends up with either an arrest, a 5150 hold, or somebody being killed. Um, cahoots model meets people where they are 24-7, 365. Mert and Murty have hour restrictions and location restrictions. I call to your attention the recent grand jury report with the problems in the behavior health department in lack of funding and lack of personnel and recommend that you not add to them another task of crisis response. I also recommend that you read the grand jury report that calls for a CAHOOTS program. CAHOOTS has been in this business since the 60s. Our county departments have no track record to compare to CAHOOTS. It appears that you're set in what you want to do for Santa Cruz County's approach to crisis, but it looks to me like you're reinventing the wheel. What's important is that crisis team be on the streets, not parked next to the Hotel Paradox. 24-7-365. Woo! Thank you. Good morning, Director Gaffney. Good morning, Chair, friend, and fellow board members. I wanted to remind you that July is Parks and Recreation Month, a very exciting month for us. Um, it's summertime, get out and enjoy it. A couple of reminders about what your parks provide, parks and recreation departments throughout the county, actually. This is not just our county parks, but this is all of us. Um, we provide, uh, we promote social equity, we support physical and emotional growth. We celebrate community character on a regular basis. We provide safe spaces that heal us both physically and emotionally. And we also are protecting our natural resources and open space, connecting people to nature and promoting the ecological function of our parklands. So get out and enjoy those parks this month. And also we left you a couple items, board members, uh, sunglasses, sunscreen, do it responsibly, a couple of reusable water bottles that are made out of metal. So thank you so much. Parks and Rec Month, July. Thank you. Oh, July 29th, family fun day at Simpkins Swim Center. So come on out. Good morning, Mr. Britton. Welcome back. Good morning, Co Britton, Matt's and Britton Architects. Uh, I'm here primarily to talk about item number 29, private plan check. Deeply appreciative to Supervisor Koenig and Supervisor McPherson for proposing this. Um, I do want to mention, though, that under state law, health and safety code, that all residential projects are allowed and the county is required to provide for private plan check if it takes more than 45 days to have plan check done. There was a letter submitted from Nossaman, uh, Associates Attorneys, um, also noting this. This is a fact. Uh, it's typical for our projects and most projects in the County of Santa Cruz, residential, including ADUs, to take over six months of county plan check time. That is so far above the 45-day excessive delay. It's absolutely important to this community to process building permits, residential building permits in a timely manner. This is not to blame county staff, it's just provide the private plan check process necessary. Second thing I wanna say in an uh, email exchange with uh, Mr. Heath, he suggested it was not the role of applicants to interpret the county code. Um, that's exactly my role as an architect. It's exactly the role of a geologist, Eric Zinn, to interpret life safety code. 
It's exactly the role of engineers to interpret life safety code. Whether or not Mr. Heath agrees with that interpretation is certainly his right. But it should be respected that it is our role and that he should actually provide substantive disagreement, not just rule by fiat. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Britton. Good morning. Welcome back. Good morning. Uh, I'm Matt Farrell. I'm here on behalf of Friends of the Rail and Trail, and we would like to speak in support of item 94, the Green Valley Multi-Use Trail, and thank staff for bringing those plans and specifications and advertising for contract forward to the board. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else in chambers before we open it up online? Okay, I'll close public comment in chambers, but open it up online, please. Call in user one, your microphone is now available. is no such thing as a safe vaccine. Every shot contains toxic chemicals. A valuable source here is learnthereth.org. Toxic chemicals like aluminum, mercury, formaldehyde, MSG, GMOs, polysorbate 80 are linked to death cancer, seizures, asthma. There's a strange echo here. Are you hearing me? Can you hear me? Okay. So a uh, valuable reference here is an article on 5G and graphene. This is from Wise Tradition Spring 2023 issue and westonaprice.org. Just a little bit of this here. 5G wireless technology is uh, the graphene is the linchpin of it. Frequencies in the 5G range, and you're putting 5G everywhere in this county, operate at more potent power densities than those in the 4G range. A recent paper in Annals of Case Reports by EMF researcher Dr. Leonard Hardell indicates that exposure to the high frequencies and power density of 5G results in a host of neurological symptoms such as tinnitus, fatigue, insomnia, emotional distress, skin disorders, and blood pressure variability. Moreover, the high energy consumed in 5G cells is discharged into the air. Exposed you, is there anybody else on clerk online? Here. Max, your microphone is now available. Hello. Worker with Santa Cruz County. I'm here today to provide additional context to the grand jury report released earlier this month, specifically to discuss why Santa Cruz County has fallen behind its neighbors when it comes to the recruitment and retention of the licensed clinicians we so desperately need. Kirsten Jewell, who spoke previously, has assembled a list of the starting and final salaries of Santa Cruz's competition, its eight nearest neighboring counties. I've compiled a PowerPoint that shares the relevant data for you to review which SEIU 521 has provided. The results of this comparison are stark. Santa Cruz County ranks in only the 35th percentile for salary on a bell curve, well below the average. To make matters worse, we slip even further behind when the cost $150 a month short of the average. The bottom line is this. In order to offer prospective hires pay that accounts for cost of living, let alone competitive pay, salaries for senior mental health client specialists in Santa Cruz would need to increase by more than $9,200 a year minimum. You've all read the grand jury report. You've seen the deficits and the vacancies. The fact is social workers are priced out of Santa Cruz County. And unless the board takes action here, the problem will only continue to grow. Our senior leadership 
is able to aggressively compete for and secure funding for vital programs in the form of state and federal grants. What they aren't able to do is staff those grants. To do that, we need you. Thank you for your time. Lori, your microphone is now available. Hi, good morning, uh, supervisors. I don't have that. also. I am a resident of Santa Cruz County at UCSC, and I am um, here to uh, provide public comment uh, in support of AB 652, which I was told would be possible to address in this public comment period today. This is the a uh, bill uh, that would establish an environmental justice advisory committee um, that would be part of the Department of Pesticides Regulation. This is a really, really important um, action for our county to protect, the, especially those workers in South County, and especially the children of those workers whose schools are very close to a lot of the fields that are being drenched still in pesticides. And so I really wanted to um, urge you to support this bill. I know there's some concern or some large figures that are associated with establishing an, an environmental justice advisory committee, but those figures do not have to be so large. It is basically a group of people getting together who are going to provide some supervisory capacity for the Department of Pesticide Regulations. So I just wanted to register my support and urging you to support as well this committee. Thank you for your service. Erica, your microphone's now available. Thank you. It's Erica Alfaro. I'm a public health nurse here, resident with Santa Cruz. Um, I am also a current president of the Bay Area National Association of Hispanic Nurses and a council member of the California Nurses for Environmental Health and Justice. I'm also here uh, speaking on behalf of um, support for item 38. Uh, to support AB 652 um, to require um, the Department of, of Pesticide Regulation to convene an Environmental Justice Advisory Committee. Um, as stated by the, the prior um, resident, uh, it is super, super important um, to have members and organizations and pertinent entities to have these important conversations about the environmental issues that are happening here in the county and in the South County as well. Uh, thank you all so much, that is it. Yon Lee, your microphone's now available. Thank you, good morning. Good morning, Supervisors. I'm here to speak on the uh, same item that my fellow colleagues just spoke on. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Supervisor Cummings for putting this on the agenda for today's meeting, uh, directing the chair to send a letter in support to uh, Senator Lair since our bill AB 652 it has passed the assembly and is currently moving to the Senate. Um, and like the other uh, colleagues just mentioned, this bill would give an opportunity for that local control, that local control that a lot of cities and counties um, ask of the state. You know, there's a lot of things that the state decides for the different communities, but who really knows the community, us that live within our cities, our counties that are affected by harmful pesticides. And again, this would be an advisory committee formed of community members from all over the state of California to provide that input and work alongside DPR uh, in order to be able to protect human health. And I think hearing a lot of, of the conversation that happened today, we are all about uh, bringing solutions forward on climate change, on basically just human health. So once again, I hope that I, and I hope and I urge all of you to vote yes on this um, item today. And once again, thank you, Supervisor Cummings, for your leadership. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Sarai, your microphone's now available. Thank you. 
Hello, can you all hear me now? Okay. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Sarai Jimenez and I am um, the Vice President for SEIU um, 521. And I'd like to add um, something in regards to the Santa Cruz County uh, Civil Grand Jury Report for diagnosis of the crisis in behavioral health for um, underfunded, understaffed and overworked report. Um, I'd also like to inform the jury of um, how understaffed we are here in the Human um, Resources Department. Um, just EBSD, which is in charge of um, food stamps, Medi-Cal, cash aid, which provide basic needs for um, members of the community. Uh, we are understaffed so severely. Um, to the point where we have 37 vacant positions open um, just in our department. Um, we are so understaffed that we actually have to um, close the uh, lobbies um, and limit the time um, Monday through Friday just from 10 to 12 to 1 to 3 because we have to um, close so many tasks as we are um, transferring um, systems, major systems. Um, so the understaffing and underfunded and overworked is not just in a crisis in the behavioral health department, but also in the human services department. Thank you. Anne, your microphone's now available. Yes, good morning, everybody. I'm Dr. Ann Lopez from Center for Farm Worker Families. And I would like to also support AB 652. I'm so delighted that this uh, bill is now uh, or has passed the assembly and is now in the Senate. And we certainly need uh, community members on the DPR who are aware of what's going on in the community. Uh, I've been working in South County now for over 25 years, and I am really tired of meeting so many farm worker families that have at least one child impacted by exposure to pesticide, uh, pesticides, everything from uh, leukemia, cancer, ADHD, uh, birth defects, learning disabilities. I mean, it is rampant. And what parents want more than anything is for their children to become educated and have a career and be out of farm work. And essentially, exposure to pesticides is destroying that dream for these hardworking farm workers. So I, I would strongly support uh, AB um, 652 in developing a group of community members to be a social justice group within the DPR. Thank you very much. Diane, your microphone's now available. Thank you and good morning, Board of Supervisors. My name is Diane Munoz and I am the coordinator of the Childhood Advisory Council of Santa Cruz County. And I'm here today um, to thank you for your approval of the consent agenda item number 42, which is our five year strategic plan for early care education and after school programs. Uh, in addition to that, we also have included the uh, child care subsidy priorities report for your approval as well. And I look forward to um, visiting each and every one of you to uh, share a summary of some of the salient points of this report. It's um, the strategic plans about 139 pages with packed full of data uh, that was recently pulled, um, giving information about uh, the child care ecosystem in our county. So I just wanted to say thank you for your support and look forward to visiting each and every one of you with council members to share a bit more about the reports. Thank you. We have no further speakers, Chair. Thank you. 
Sir, you would still like to speak? Yes, please. All right, please go ahead and step forward. Is there anybody else in chambers? Because I want to make sure that we can get to the action. Okay. Please, this will be our last speaker. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. My name is Kevin Cisneros. I'm the only licensed mental health clinician on the MERT team I, that, was just after, uh, that was just mentioned. Um, I felt compelled to speak today. I came for support. Um, to support, I felt compelled to speak that um, I think that we really need to take a look at uh, on supporting our licensed mental health clinicians at, at the county. Um, I know that we are understaffed. I've sat in on interview meetings and we've had candidates who have not accepted positions. Um, and I think that, that as you know, we try and build our crisis continuum, that's gonna be an issue is looking at being able to hire these people and keep them here. Um, yeah, so that's what I'd like to say. And currently right now I have to leave and go assess a kid that's on a 5585 hold at Dominican since I am the only licensed mental health clinician with the Mert team. And I thank you for your time. Thank you, thank you for your work. All right, we will close public comment and bring it to the board for action on the consent agenda. I'll start with uh, Supervisor Cummings. Are there any comments on consent? Sure, thank you, Chair, and thank you <clears throat> to all the members of the public who showed up here today. Um, I know that there's some, um, I was, I'm going to hold back, I have some comments related to what we've been hearing about mental health workers, but I know we have an item on our regular agenda um, related to this topic, so I'm going to hold my comments on that until then. Um, Regarding the operational plan, I just want to thank uh, the staff for working on this and um, would like to follow up to see how we can operationalize um, some of the various items that are coming forward within that operational plan. Um, item number 36 is dissolving the Homeless 2x2 two two Commission with the City of Santa Cruz. Um, we now have the Housing for Health Partnership um, Policy Board, which is an expanded um, version of the 2x2 two two to actually include nonprofits who work with homeless folks um, and representatives from all the cities and the county. And I really want to appreciate the formation of that group because I know that um, expanding transparency around how funds for homelessness are spent was a priority and just want to thank the city and the county for their years of collaboration to help us around the topic of homelessness. But dissolving this would uh, eliminate some redundancy and so I just want to thank the city, uh, the county staff and the city of Santa Cruz staff for working on um, how we can um, move forward with a more transparent process. <clears throat> um, in addition to that, I did want to um, see if we could have a little bit of follow-up discussion on item number 96, which was the zone 7A withdrawal. I'm just wondering if the county CAO could just comment on what's gotten us to that point and maybe provide a little bit of the history on that since some, some folks asked for it to get pulled, but um, since it wasn't pulled, just wanting to see if we can follow up on some of the comments that were made earlier. <laughs> Yes, uh, we have um, Director Machado here who can give the back background on this item. Thank you, Chair and Supervisors and Supervisor Cummings. Uh, appreciate the question, the opportunity. Matt Machado, Director of CDI, also District Engineer for uh, Zone 7. Um, I'm happy to describe whatever you'd like. You want me to just give a quick overview of the whole? Okay. So uh, Zone 7A is an impact fee program that new development pays into to mitigate localized flooding problems and regional flooding problems. Um, and so when we executed the agreement last December, the 7A agreement with PERFMA, it was, it's written and understood that PERFMA would take that responsibility to implement that program, that 7A program. So they would consider local flooding troubles, problems, and the regional one, which we all know about is the river project. That was the understanding. We believe it's written that way. This past spring, we got clear indication in writing that those local flooding projects would not be considered, would not be a part of the CIP for PERFMA, would not be considered from a funding perspective. And so we took exception to that. We tried to negotiate uh, more clarity and balance uh, between uh, Zone 7A and PERFMA so that we had a better understanding going forward. Uh, that compromise was rejected. And so we've been left with no, uh, no options. 
Uh, so the recommended action before you today is really to um, terminate that agreement. I do think it allows us the opportunity to um, draft a new agreement that has that needed clarity, the detail, the balance that the community needs to where the local flooding problems and the regional problems are equally addressed. And so that's the, the backstory there. Happy to share more if you like. If I could um, just comment on um, the local flooding uh, issues um, that Mr. Machado mentioned. Um, this is, we're devastating floods in the unincorporated area. Uh, we had um, in whole neighborhoods, uh, houses um, completely flooded three separate times in the unincorporated area. Um, some of those issues can be addressed by these funds and were, are meant to be addressed by these funds. And so that's all we're asking is that uh, the flooding in the neighborhoods uh, that were devastating, let me say, they weren't, uh, maybe they didn't receive the same press coverage as other issues, but they were devastating to those families involved. And so we just wanna make sure that we can address them um, at the same time as addressing the larger regional issues. Thank you for that. And I just hope that, and I don't know if we need to provide additional direction, but my hope would be that by taking action on this today, as it's been recommended, that you all will continue in your conversations to work towards a, another agreement so that we can continue um, working collaboratively, co collaboratively with the, J, the other members of the JPA. Thank you. Yes. Um, if you don't mind, since I think there's others that want to speak specifically on 96, I'll come back to you. Supervisor Coney, get a question on 96. Yeah, since we're on this topic, I just had one question about it, which is, um, you know, I certainly understand the fact that, you know, really we're probably, we're, we're definitely legally obligated to use these 7A funds to address the flood impacts for people who have been paying those impact fees. Um, I wonder if either uh, Director Machado or CEO Palacios could address just this concern that, I mean, if in my understanding is the 7A fees do make up a substantial part of the reserves for PERFMA. Um, you know, are we looking at, so there's the option one of, of coming back with the more explicit agreement that PERFMA would address these other projects. Um, are there other options to, you know, uh, make sure that the reserves for PERFMA remain uh, at a healthy balance so that it can carry out its work as well? So I'll comment on the PERFMA reserves. Um, you know, the Pajara River project is a $500 million project. Um, the construction dollars have been identified, both the federal and the local match through state, state legislation. And so they're in good shape in that regard. I think when you look at capital reserves, there's always gonna be not enough to do everything in the world, but that's where the balance and the, and the um, all issues covered equally. And so, uh, speaking back to what we thought was uh, a fair middle road for clarity and balance, uh, the item that went to the PERFMA board a couple weeks back was to put half of those reserves into the larger PERFMA uh, reserves and the other half to go towards these localized flooding projects so that we could leverage that money up and pursue grants and other funds so that we could implement literally millions of dollars of projects on that local match of a half a million dollars. I think that uh, when you look at this conversation about a half a million dollars or even a million dollars relative to a $500 million project, it's a very small amount. It's not, it's not uh, gonna break the bigger project, it's just not. And even if you look at the cash flow analysis, it's not gonna break it, it just isn't. Uh, but it's significant money, so I don't wanna you know, downplay half a million dollars or a million dollars. But the way we see it is that we could take that money and leverage it up to even greater things and more community service. And so I hope in the future we can get back to that balance and clarity so that we could serve everybody as best we can, even though resources are limited in the day. We know that. Thank you. Thank you for that additional clarity. Are there any questions on 96 before I go back to, or comments on 96 before I go back to um, Supervisor Cummings? Well, I'll make some brief comments just because I, I serve in a dual capacity here. I'm chair of the board here, I'm chair of, the, of PERFMA. And we had a robust discussion uh, at the PERFMA meeting in regards to this. And I viewed it just from a more macro perspective. And people this winter suffered flooding from various sources. You had the, the river, main river flooding, you had the tributary flooding, and you had local agricultural drainage and culvert ditches that also caused uh, flooding to homes. 
I don't think that the community necessarily is concerned with where their flooding comes from or who's funding it. They just want to get the issues fixed. And uh, what was proposed was a compromise uh, solution to try and get us moving forward on this. I completely understand why uh, the board majority on Perfman, it was a three to two vote just for those that weren't present, un, um, were concerned with uh, taking this action. I do see what's on today's board though item as just the next step in a conversation of continued negotiation because it is the only uh, mechanism to continue the conversation since a definitive action had already been taken by the Perfma board. So to Supervisor Cummings' uh, point, I think we could actually add additional direction to make that clear to the Perfma board, the Perfma staff, and our staff that the intention with today is that this is just the next step in a process of continued discussion that unfortunately because the vote was what it was at, at the Perfma board didn't sort of ended that conversation. This, this is the county's ability to try and restart that conversation. Uh, but as somebody who, um, I, I mean, I think I can confidently say has spent more time on this issue than any other county supervisor, or I would actually say any other elect, local elected official in the region, um, I'm comfortable with A, the fact that we've secured nearly 500 million for the main STEM project, and B, uh, also, uncomfortable with the fact that there are other elements of flooding that are impacting homes broader in the zone that still need to be addressed and but for the funding through this will not uh, get done. So so I think that this continues that, that conversation. I'll hand it back to you, Supervisor. Thank you. I have no further comments. Oh, well, that was dramatic then. <laughs> uh, Supervisor Hernandez, please. Well, I have a few comments on a few items also. Uh, I have a few comments on a few items. I'll start off with 96. You know, uh, I think the CAO was mentioning we do have some, some very critical needs in District 4. And just recently, I, I found out more about the project in, in Zach's district as well. But we have the area of College, College Lake, Celsi Puedes Creek, and Coralitos Creek that really flooded uh, two separate communities with over 200 homes there. And it flooded them three separate times. So there's a real critical need there, uh, the area of Paulson. Uh, and also I had, a, I had a coffee with the sheriffs and I had a constituent, one of Zach's constituents that came in and spoke to me about some area by Buena Vista that was uh, flooded as well. So, you know, there's a real need and there's, you know, real flooding that is um, completely dam uh, damaging people's homes. And so those are the areas that we want to address. Uh, and I, you know it's it's critical to our to our constituents here in Santa Cruz County, um, and it's something that we have to resolve or either you know resolve at some point. And so that's that's what I'll say about that. Um, a few other things. Uh, uh, item thirty. I want to thank uh, Supervisor Koenig on his leadership on this uh, project as well with the uh, container-based uh, sanitation pilot program. Um, I think it's a great need for folks in the North County and folks that want to do sm uh, small homes. Um, item 41, I want to thank uh, my newest fire district commissioner, Kurt, Kurt Vojova, but also I want to uh, commend him on his uh, recent retirement from the Watsonville Fire Department. Uh, he served a long time there and just retired yesterday. And now today he's being appointed uh, as a fire di for the fire district uh, for the county. Uh, item 54, I want to welcome uh, Lisa Hernandez for the county health officer uh, here in the county. And item 94, the Green Valley uh, trails. You know, uh, when I, every time I drive through there on both sides, you see uh, commemoration candles and uh, of, of Bicyclists and pedestrians have passed away on that road, Green Valley Road. Uh, you know, and it's, you think about it, and you know, some of them are traveling to the parks there that we have, both Pino and the County Pino. And so it's, I think that this is a step in the right direction for reducing um, bicycle and pedestrian fatalities, but also serious collisions. So kudos to this project, making sure we get trails and and also once the project comes in for the resurfacing of Green Valley Road. So 
that's it for my comments. Thank you, Supervisor Hernandez. Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I want to begin by thanking all of the uh, healthcare workers who came out today to share their experiences with the board. Um, it's a statistic, the vacancies, you know, of 30 to 40 percent that certainly I've been aware of for a long time. Uh, but hearing your own testimony about how this impacts your day to day jobs is uh, really impactful and puts it into a much more human context. So thank you. Um, I'm going to next look at a number of the items on our consent agenda that address housing. Um, because after all, one of the things driving uh, these vacancies and the cost of living in our community is housing. We learned recently that we are the most expensive rental market in the country, sort of ignominious distinction. Um, so first of all, in item 22, the operational plan for 2023 through 2025, I want to thank the CAO's office, particularly um, uh, Sven Stafford and Nicole Co Coburn for their work on this. I think, you know, like the budget that we'd uh, at our last meeting, the processes have been set in place um, to help the county move forward, including these incremental operational goals for each department is really important. In particular, I appreciate operational goals uh, number 349 and number 350, which identify streamlining the processes for subdivision and final map approval in the planning department. Uh, time is money, and the delays that we see for projects, including just things like trying to schedule final map approval uh, or partial release of securities for, uh, on our board agenda, definitely add uh, significant costs to projects, and that ultimately leads to higher housing costs. Um, and we have actually an example of that with item 92, Maplethorpe, a partial release of securities. Uh, happy to see this project close to opening uh, in my district. It'll be um, some essential new housing units. Um, but again, this I, I know speaking to the, the builder on this project that it's taken a number of months to get onto our agenda um, and that you know essentially they have to pay interest on uh, their bonds, which adds to the final cost of the housing. So I'm glad that we're, we're in alignment that uh, we need to help improve that. On item 29, third party plan check program, uh, thank you to Supervisor McPherson and to the planning division for working on this with me. Um, I think that um, ultimately this will help bring uh, all resources to the table as we address the um, delays and, uh, that, and, and long time it's taking to approve new permits in the planning department. Um, you know, and I also wanna acknowledge that just like uh, with behavioral health, we're seeing staff shortfalls uh, in the planning department too, because it's just difficult to hire for these positions. And of course, we funded a lot of those positions actually in last year's budget, and we've had challenges filling them uh, over this year. And so I don't think that it's necessarily anyone's fault, um, but uh, we know we do need to look at ways to bring more resources to the table. Um, and so this third party plan check program, um, something that we identified that Marin County and Sonoma County are doing, um, which essentially lets applicants uh, bring uh, private resources to the table to help uh, review the plans faster um, and hopefully also work collaboratively with staff to get plans approved faster. Uh, I will point out that, you know, I think over the last 30 to 50 years, we've taken the attitude, um, it largely implemented through our, our uh, plan check process, that we have a moral obligation moral obligation to make sure that everyone is kept as safe as possible and that we check just every single possible box uh, to ensure that the environment is um, left as intact as possible whenever we build. And um, I think we've certainly achieved those goals. I think maybe we've gone a little bit too far. Um, at this point, we have a moral obligation to build housing, to support our healthcare workers, to support more folks for the planning department, for all county workers, and of course, all the, the folks that our other businesses in the community need, um, teachers, et cetera. Um, and I think that, um, you know, particularly when it comes to projects in the, within the urban services line, we need to shift a focus a little bit now that uh, our moral obligation is to make it as easy as possible to bring new housing units online because it's gonna take a while working on this before we make real progress, you know? I mean, just as, you know, here we are in summer, the hot, it, the, the lightest day of the year may be behind us, but we, the hottest days are still ahead. Uh, it's going to take some time to address this problem. It could even get worse before it gets better, but uh, we, we need to work collaboratively together on it to move forward. Um, item 35, the resolution to sell surplus real property located at Bro uh, 7th and Bromer. I'm excited that this 
very large property that's currently um, owned by the county and the redevelopment agency could see a project soon. And of course, uh, there was some concern by a member of the community that um, you know we should be using it for affordable housing. That's of course exactly what we're we're trying to do. Uh, it's through the Surplus uh, Lands Act, we're offering it up to uh, affordable housing developers first. Um, so I hope that we can see some additional housing capacity built there. Um, on item 37, I want to thank Supervisor Cummings for bringing forward this uh, support for AB 309, the Social Housing Act. Um, I definitely um, you know, sp sp agree that um, we need to bring all resources to the table, including uh, you know, as much state funding as possible uh, to address the supply side of this problem, to build as much housing as possible. And we've absolutely seen uh, in other communities around the world uh, that this can work. A New York Times article uh, called Renters Utopia, which talked about how uh, Vienna has invested heavily uh, in social housing over decades, um, and it's worked definitely jumps to mind and makes me think that it can work here in California as well. So i um, happy to support AB 309. On item 30, the status report on the Give Love on and container-based sanitation project. I also want to thank Supervisor Hernandez for his partnership on this. Um, you know, this, uh, I think it's incredibly important to advance our uh, research into composting toilet options in general. Um, and this container-based sanitation project does that. Um, I think that it will be able to uh, um, provide some data on how we can compost safely in our community. Um, hopefully, ultimately, to allow it as, a, as an option for uh, you know, individual property owners. But then also, of course, the, the intent of this program is to provide an emergency option as well. Uh, we came surprisingly and dangerously close to losing the Watsonville uh, wastewater treatment plant this winter during the floods. And that could have knocked out sanitation services for 60 to 70,000 people. Uh, we, we need a plan B for people to go number two. And uh, that's exactly what we're trying to provide here. Um, and um, um, I want to thank the Public Works, Community Development, and the Infrastructure Department for working with Give Love um, to help make sure we have a backup. Um, and finally, on item 65, the creation of a Housing for Health vendor pool. I want to thank the Housing for Health Division for bringing this forward. It's definitely important that we're able to move quickly uh, to take advantage of new state grants that are available. It seems another one is popping up all the time. Um, and of course, to respond to emergencies as needed. So um, I think this is a great step forward. So my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Koenig. Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm going to add to the comments that have been made in number 22, the operations plan. I want to thank the uh, CAO and all the department staff who've worked on this, uh, which is a critical counterpart to our budget every year. Um, we want to align our expenditures with our strategic goals in a way that is measurable and transparent to the public. Uh, it's also been a little more difficult that uh, We've done, uh, had to follow the, or not had to, we, we had an original plan, but we had to pivot uh, because of the uh, natural disasters and the p pandemic. And I think we've done a great job of doing that as best we could under the circumstance and with the financial resources that we have. Um, on item number 29, the third uh, party plan check that was mentioned uh, previously, I want to thank uh, Supervisor Koenig. Uh, it's been a pleasure to work with him on try, uh, trying to address the backlog on the permits that we have. Um, a substantial uh, step in the county is to align our policies so that uh, home builders that can navigate the permit process uh, with a much more predictable time frame and cost that has been experienced uh, historically. And I want uh, we want to build housing uh, that respects the environmental and safety regulations that we have in the process. And it's been difficult to do in some respects because of new regulations that have been passed down by the state and federal government regarding septic tanks or uh, uh, sand hills, uh, geographic, geological uh, issues. Um, this has not been an easy, easy climb, but uh, I think we're there and this will really help us get to accommodating more people who want to uh, rebuild. Um, on item number 51, uh, when the board uh, uh, approved the climate action plan uh, last December, it was gratifying to see uh, the county was at the forefront of developing a comprehensive plan in this regard. Um, I'm very happy that this update includes applying for grant funds set up by the Community Resilience Center and the Defensible Space Assistant Grant Program. 
Um, these are things that you have to go through, you have to apply, you have to get the financial resources before you can implement these programs. Uh, the fifth district, uh, my district, has suffered six disasters in the past several years. And we have found that providing a place for residents to go as disasters unfold or just even when the power goes off has become an essential service. Um, and, and to have a fund that can assist residents uh, with the defensible space around their home will go a long way to toward preventing and dev the devastating losses that we've experienced during the CZU fire. Uh, my thanks to OR3 staff and their partners within the Resource Conservation District also, the library system and the fire agencies for your work on these grants. Uh, it's been a real, real cooperative uh, effort and I appreciate it very much. And um, the appointment, and we're going to hear about uh, shortly about the outgoing health officer, but congratulations to Dr. Lisa Hernandez uh, for being selected this critical position in the county. She brings an excellent mix of experience and a role that has some big shoes to full, fill um, with uh, from Dr. Newell. Um, and lastly, on item 96, I'm really glad to see that uh, there can be some construction, constructive conversations about how we can uh, work this issue out. Um, and I just want to say thanks to the healthcare workers we've heard many from uh, today. And we have uh, via emails and uh, texts of one type or another. Um, this is a, a crisis situation and we're going to try to fill it the best way we can with the resources that we have. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. I'll speak to just a couple brief items on 36 and support of Supervisor Cummings on the commission item. I would also like to continue to encourage the CAO's office to review our commission structure for just efficacy, redundancy, and necessity. It's time that we do a review in general to ensure that the ones we have are, are necessary and valid. And on 54, um, welcoming Dr. Hernandez back to uh, our county. Uh, it would talk about impossible shoes to fill, but I think that if somebody were to fill them, we found the right person, a little bit biased because of a Georgetown background that she has, but she's got an amazing background. I mean, undergrad at Yale, public master's of public health at Berkeley, graduate or medical degree at Georgetown. Uh, she could be doing a lot of things and she chose to be in public service. This is a huge gift to our community to have Dr. Lisa Hernandez coming back. On uh, 94, a, a district item that I share with the Green Valley Multi-Use Trail with Supervisor Hernandez, uh, great appreciation to Public Works and in particular, uh, Mr. Wiesner on this. This is a very complicated project. It was very expensive. It took a lot of advocacy and work at the state to get the funding that it received, and then a lot of investment at the local level. Both of our districts contributed via Measure D over the last couple of years to help make this uh, happen. In fact, there's been more investments in that corridor in the last couple of years than there's been in, a, in an, over a generation from both investments in the parks of Pinto Lake to what's happening on Green Valley right now. This, this is essential uh, down there, but it's also transformational. It's very exciting to see. Just my last comment on 96. Uh, one thing that is good during this whole discussion is the fact that we're actually talking about investments and repairs. <laughs> the discussion is different, finally. I mean, we're, the debate now is over how we're going to make investments, and for 70 years we were talking about we didn't have any money. So, uh, you know, one of the things that we sometimes need is the 30,000 foot view to remember the thing, the trajectory has shifted. and I. I think that although sometimes people get caught up in sort of the legal elements of this, I mean, at the end of the day, we're talking about how to invest down there, people's lives, make them better, and, and that's good because funding's been made available. So I'll bring it back to the board. It'd be appropriate now for a motion. I'll move the consent agenda. And, uh, you know, before that, I just want to make sure that I thank all the healthcare workers that were here and behavioral healthcare workers for addressing some of the issues with behavioral health, staffing, and housing all, as well. I just want to make sure we have the additional directions included. Yes, uh, and the additional direction. We have a motion from Supervisor Hernandez. Uh, uh, we'll get to you what the additional direction is. I could tell. Uh, yeah, is there a second? Yeah, I, I was going to second and provide this. Uh, Thank you. I was going to second and provide uh, an add direction on item number 36, 96, sorry, for staff to continue discussions around a mutually agreeable contract to address flooding issues in Zone 7A. And that's acceptable to the maker? Yes. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any additional direction? Um, if we could have a roll call, please. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Friend? Aye. And that passes unanimously. We'll move on to the first item of the regular agenda, which is to consider authorizing the issuance of a proclama proclamation honoring County Health Officer Dr. Gail Newell on her retirement from the County of Santa Cruz to be signed by all members of the board is recommended in the memo of the chair. 
Um, I, I, if you don't mind, I'm actually gonna kick this off with some comments and then we'll open it up uh, for Dr. Newell. I mean, Dr. Newell, so Dr. Newell came in, in 2019 to this position. Um, if you would have had a magic eight ball or fortune telling, you may have reconsidered uh, the job offer that came your way because less than a year later, uh, we were faced with you know, obviously a worldwide pandemic that Santa Cruz County led the way on. And for those of us that were on the board at the time, um, just to give you a little bit of a behind the scenes understanding, Dr. Newell made herself unbelievably available, not just to us, but to the entire community to answer questions, constant community outreach, working with other cities and elected officials, always in an understanding, compassionate, but science-based way. And this did not play out that well across the country. There was a lot of conflict sometimes with elected officials and the county public health officer that did not happen here. Uh, there was communities that didn't feel informed that didn't happen here. And there were communities that had significantly worse outcomes uh, as a result of decisions that were made, which also didn't happen here because almost solely due uh, to the work of Dr. Gail Newell. It didn't come without personal consternation and strife. It didn't come out with uh, some inappropriate actions from some unfortunately members of the community. Um, and that is why a number of health officers have stepped down across the state. But Dr. Newell uh, saw it all the way through the end. And, and I know that people never thank you for things that they didn't realize could have happened to them but didn't. You never get rewarded in politics for what you prevent. You only get uh, rewarded for responding to crisis and which is an unfortunate component of the system, but there are people in our community that are alive because of Dr. Gail Newell that would not be alive otherwise. Your placement as our county health officer at that point and that time couldn't have been more fortuitous to our community. And I'm deeply, deeply in debt to you, uh, deeply in debt to your uh, leadership. So thank you, Dr. Newell. I'm gonna open it up for other board members and then we'll make sure that Dr. Newell uh, has to, for the millionth time, speak in front of everybody. Uh, Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I will say, Dr. Newell, the first thing that struck me taking uh, this, this position in the middle of the pandemic was just how open, available, and responsive uh, you were. Um, I think there was a number of times that you know, we were, issues were coming up last minute and you were always there. I'm mean, extremely responsive with the text, finding a solution. Um, and so it was, it became pretty apparent uh, pretty quickly to me how, what an amazing work ethic you have. Um, and um, also just you're incredibly pleasant person to deal with amazingly through, throughout this. You never lost your cool. Um, and I will say, I mean, if, you, if anyone has any doubts, uh, the, the data is right here, right, to su support what an incredible job Dr. Newell has, has done. I mean, the highest vaccination rates uh, in the state at 77%, um, I mean, 40% of the, the average uh, number of deaths per, per capita um, of any ca uh, compared to the rest of the state. Um, it's, and you know, now we're in the top 10 of all the healthiest counties in California. Uh, it's, it's clear that uh, you've done an amazing job and uh, can't thank you enough. And I guess the last thing I'll say is also the health dashboards that you helped create um, throughout the pandemic were incredibly useful uh, and in, in showing how the, uh, the virus was impacting people throughout our community and was actually really insightful for me seeing um, just how many similarities there were, for example, between Mid-County and South County. Um, and I think it, it was enlightening to have a better understanding of the um, demographic distribution in our community and, and how uh, there are really inequitable impacts from the virus. But of course, we you made sure that we did everything we could as far as uh, getting those vaccine clinics open in South County first to, uh, to address those. So thank you. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Thank you. I, I could repeat every word that's been said. Uh, you're a special person. Uh, and I think I want to just summarize uh, the situation with the pandemic that we addressed. You took an issue that was scary and controversial, and you made it sane and understandable. And I thank you for that. And we have a healthy county because of you. And thank you very much. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. 
uh, Supervisor Cummings. Thank you, Chair. And um, I just wanna, I mean, I agree with everything that's been said, so I'm not gonna reiterate everything, but um, just also wanna um, thank you for your bravery because um, I, you know, as elected officials, we all receive nasty grams and all sorts of, um, you know, emails of shut things down, open things up, this is fake, this is not fake. And, um, and I know that you had, um, had received a, a very, you know, some, some serious uh, threats and throughout all of it, you continued to persevere, to represent our county and to help make sure that everyone remains safe. And so just wanna thank you for um, your persistence and diligence to ensure that we had a, uh, a safe uh, community. Um, and then I also want to just highlight um, and thank you for uh, your willingness to collaborate with UCSC. Um, you know, back when the pandemic first started, for some folks who don't know, um, the amount of testing per capita was a really um, big deal in terms of being able to reopen more quickly. And there was a lab on campus that I'd been in touch with who said, you know, we're going to create our own test. And initially, some people wrote them off and said, no, we're like, we're not going to do that. We're just going to go with Quest Diagnostic. But um, Dr. Newell was open to having conversations with them. And as a result, we actually doubled the testing capacity within our county, which allowed us to reopen more quickly. And so, you know, we, um, compared to many of the other counties throughout the state of California and the country, I mean, we were able to open in a way that was safe. And it was largely because of the willingness to have the county collaborate with UCSC to expand our testing capacity. And so I just want to thank you for that. That willingness because it did um, allow us to be able to get out and continue our daily lives um, while we navigated the the, um, the the pandemic. And so um, I'll stop there because I can continue to go on and on about how great you've been and how great it's been to work with you. But um, being mayor during that time, I was just so grateful to be able to have someone who brought the signs forward and we were able to communicate that out in a way that was effective. So thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Hernandez. And I, you know, I really want to commend all the work you've done and thank you for your work, you know, and really, especially during the pandemic, right? You know, I think that all the, uh, my, it, it was my introduction to the Zoom world, you know, your, your, your weekly briefly, briefings that, that you had. And then especially when you started including the infographics to the meetings, because uh, it really shed a light to South County and it really um, made us, Make, make sure that we supported South County and kept it health healthy. Um, and so thank you for that. Thank you. Mr. Palacios. Um, yes, Dr. Neal, I just wanted to thank you on behalf of county staff, especially you had a great partnership uh, with the CAO's office, with the sheriff, um, with the county council, uh, with our parks and with all the county staff. I just wanna thank you for that uh, very important partnership. I also want to thank you uh, from the very beginning. You emphasized equity as a, as a very important value uh, that you had and that the county had and this board had and that you were from the very, very first step uh, thinking about those individuals who are most vulnerable in our community, those farm workers and service workers who were out and could not shelter in place uh, and those uh, suffering from compromised health you were out there uh, really advocating for them from the very beginning under great pressure. Let me tell you, there was a, a lot of pressure uh, in those days. And, uh, and I, we were there with you, the county council and the sheriff and, and I and, and this board also. And we, uh, this board was supportive of you in making those tough decisions to uh, value equity as one of the most important values. That was a very difficult uh, and now we look back and think, oh, it was, it was easy to do that. Of course it makes sense. It was very difficult because I remember those, those very difficult conversations we had in the community when you were prioritizing those uh, individuals in the farm worker community and service uh, worker community who could not shelter in place. So thank you for that. I really I will always appreciate you for that. Thank you, Mr. Heath. <clears throat> Dr. Newell, just seeing your smile. Um, I, you know, I was, I was in the foxhole with you very early on when this got started. And I want to underscore something that Supervisor Friend said, which is that um, there are people who are alive today who would not be alive in this community without what you did. And um, you are such an unbelievable credit to your profession. And I'm going to miss you professionally. I'm going to miss you personally. And I just wish you all the best in, in your next chapter. Thank you. Now, we are going to open up, Dr. Newell, if you don't 
Well, actually, we're gonna open it up for the community because we do have an, an, an action item. So if there's members of the community who would like to address us, and uh, part of this may illustrate some of the challenges that we dealt with, but we'll, we'll open it up for the community, uh, for members of the community, for an opportunity to address us on this proclamation. Hello, my name is James Ewing Whitman. You know, I would love to take you up, Gail Newell, on sitting down to have coffee. I really would. Because um, I ran into a mutual friend on Sunday who I hadn't seen in two months because after her second booster, she developed some really serious health issues. So, you know, I have a lot of friends that are retired and they seem to be, they've never been so busy as after they're retired. So I, you know, there's a lot of things that I could actually say. And, um, you know, a mistake does not become an error unless you refuse to correct it. You know, I could take the time to read something published in the Santa Cruz Sentinel by Jessica York on May 29th, 2020. It's written right here, but I don't know if it really serves much of a purpose except people can look at that. Um, I'm in kind of disagreement with all of this praise. And I think you all that know me know that I could come up for reasons why. I could speak for quite some length upon that. Um, so what's happened in the past is, has happened. It's done. We can't change anything. Uh, something came up this morning on my Facebook that I thought was quite fascinating. It said, if you could telepathically say something to all 7.9 billion people on Earth right now, what would it be? I wrote, return to the natural human state of being a magnetobiological crystal fifth element being with an unannihilable unique creator energies provided and then share them. I have 10 seconds. So, you know, people don't realize that every human breath, breath is 10 to the seven atoms. If you were to look in a, a huge stadium and the nucleus was the center, the, the protons would be at the very outside. So there's a lot to do, and I really would like Thank to have you. coffee with you. Is there anybody else from the community that would like to address us on this item? Feel free to line up if you'd like to. Sheriff Hart, welcome. Good morning, Chairman, Board of Supervisors, Jim Hart, Sheriff Corner. And I just want to let you know, Dr. Newell, that I really appreciated the relationship that we had during the whole pandemic event. And uh, a lot of people in the public weren't privy to the, a lot of the conversations that were going on, particularly from epidemiology and what some of the predictions were. And we were looking at a, a catastrophic event locally with some of the early numbers. And and so I, I, I felt like we, we worked in lockstep together to try to keep our community as safe as possible. And, and for you, the, the amount of blowback that you were getting, the amount of negative comments, I felt like you really handled that with courage and, and empathy too. You, you, uh, you didn't lash out at those people. You just, you just kept your head down and did your job. And so uh, we're gonna miss you and I, I wish you the best in your retirement. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to address us on this item in chambers? Director Gaffney, welcome back. Thank you, uh, Director Gaffney for County Parks. I just wanted to say, Gail, thank you so much. Um, I had employees that were scared. They were needing to take care of other people's children so that other people could go to work. And we didn't know what to do at times. And you gave us strength, guidance, support, and uh, had a vision for how we could do that, as was said, in an equitable, ma equitable manner. And uh, I don't think this community could ever thank you enough. So thank you so much. Thank you. Anybody else in chambers? Good morning, welcome back. Good morning. I just wanted to speak on behalf of the public who has um, maybe a different opinion um, than all of you. I've been reading Karen Kingston's Substacks, and I would um, send other community members who are watching this uh, remotely to go ahead and check out Karen Kingston, who worked for Pfizer. I've read the patents myself. I worked at Santa Cruz Biotechnology. I've made injections that go into the human body containing metals and, and toxins such as formaldehyde and the marisol. And I had to work in a fume hood. And when we put those chemicals in animals, they all died. You just mentioned that there were a couple people who died suddenly and unexpectedly and you know, I'm wondering if there's a connection. So I just want to <coughs> say my part in that. 
Is there anybody else in chambers? Welcome back, council member. Hi, thank you. I just wanted to take a quick moment. Uh, my name is Kristen Brown. I was mayor of Capitola in 2020 when the pandemic started. And many may not be aware that at that time, all of the mayors in the cities within the county of Santa Cruz met uh, weekly with uh, Dr. Newell and her guidance through that time was incredibly invaluable for those of us trying to determine how best to lead our cities through a very difficult time uh, in the pandemic. So I just wanted to take a quick moment to thank you from the bottom of my heart for the leadership uh, that you've shown through the county and all of those of us who are also trying to uh, best lead during that time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anybody else in chambers before we open it up online? Okay, is there anybody online? Yes, Chair. Call in user one. Your microphone's now available. Marilyn Garrett, there are many adverse reactions to these shots, and you have a pharmaceutical perspective here, and that's all I'm hearing. But um, refer you to a doc a paper here covid shots for adults and children what we know now this is from weston a prize foundation weston a prize dot org uh, just a few figures here there have been more reported adverse reactions and deaths from covid shots than from all the other vaccines combined. This is part of the VAERS reporting system. Also, um, Pfizer documents released by court order confirm that in women whose pregnancy outcomes were known, 87.5% of pregnancies ended in a miscarriage during clinical trials. Where is the report of the adverse effects and deaths that have occurred from the shots? including myocarditis deaths in young athletes who received the COVID shots and are falling over dead as they're playing sports. Um, I honor people who work for genuine health and um, are to boost our innate immune system, not to destroy it. That's what the vaccines do. I hope Dr. Newell and you read the real Anthony Fauci, Bill Gates, big phone. Online? We have no further speakers, Chair. Mm -hmm. All right, let's bring it to the board for a motion on the proclamation. Um, a second. We have a motion from Supervisor McPherson, a second from Supervisor Cummings. If we could have a roll call on that, please. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Friend? Aye. And that passes unanimously. really feel seen and heard. Thank you all. And thank you to everybody who spoke, everyone. Um, one of the things I love so much about Santa Cruz County is the values of freedom of speech, freedom to protest, the values that make our democracy strong and great. And um, that's really apparent here today. So proud. It's been a huge privilege to serve this county as a public servant the last four years. So thank you for that opportunity. 
Um, I'm very excited for Dr. Lisa Hernandez to be filling my shoes. She's gonna do a fantastic job. So glad she's returning to the county to do that. She's a great choice. I wanna take this opportunity to thank um, just a few of the most supportive people in my life besides all of you and you and the sheriff and under sheriff um, and all of the county team that's been so supportive. Um, my deputy health officers, very, very important, um, who after the first few months of the pandemic gave me some relief from 24 seven call and the ongoing stresses. So Dr. David Ghilarducci and Dr. Cal Gordon deserve huge thanks. Um, my right hand woman at the beginning of the pandemic, Mimi Hall, and now um, Monica Morales, and my partner through it all, Jen Herrera, is in the chambers here and deserves a big thank you as well. Um, Emily Chung, Director of Public Health, and so many of my county health team. I'm sure I'm forgetting others who are very important. Um, special thanks, of course, to my family, especially my wife, who uh, Kelly Bungesser, who put up with all of the threats and harassment at my side. My daughter, Madeline Newell, who lived with us at the time as well um, and had some very frightening experiences herself. Um, I'm proud to leave a legacy of uh, one of the lowest COVID death rates in the nation. Um, we have half the mortality rate from COVID for the state average and less than a third of that from the nation. So that's hundreds, perhaps thousands of lives saved with the, I'm giving credit to the entire community. It wasn't just me, it wasn't just public health or HSA or the county government. Um, big kudos to the South County community and group who helped achieve those equity goals. Um, their partnership has been invaluable. They knew, know who they are. And um, I wanna challenge uh, the county to continue to work on the public health crises that remain. Um, racism, we must continue to work on racism, equity, diversity, inclusion in our workforce and the county in general and the opioid crisis that continues to claim many, many lives in our county. And uh, we need to work on that one actively. Um, and in closing though, I'd like to say, remind us that we're all so blessed to live in this generally healthy and prosperous and free county of Santa Cruz. So thank you for making that possible and thank you to the entire community. Dr. Newell, um, we do actually have a very brief 1045 scheduled item that we, we need to do right now because it was agendized as such. Um, so I'll take one minute for the clerk. Do you see anybody online that needs to be uh, promoted for the zone seven meeting? I think maybe is not group? seeing anyone at okay. this time. Okay. Um, so what we are going to do is we are going to um, call to order the Flood Control and Water Conservation District Zone 7 uh, special meeting. If we could begin with a roll call for Zone 7, please. Director Koenig. Here. Cummings. Here. Hernandez. Here. McPherson. Here. Colbertson. Absent. And Quiroz Carter. Here. Oh. If you feel free to come on forward. Good to see you. You can grab right there. Thank you for coming up here. And director friend. Here. Thank you, council member. Um, are there any changes to today's agenda? No. I think you need to just press, it's on the bottom. There you go. Good morning. No, there are no changes to the agenda. All right. This is, uh, we'll do oral communications as an opportunity for members of the community to address us on items not on today's agenda, but within the purview of zone seven. Would anybody like to address us in chambers? Is there anybody online, Madam Clerk? Yes, we do have a speaker online. 
Call in user one, your microphone is now available. Marilyn Garrett, I would like to refer you to a website, geoengineeringwatch.org with Dane Wigington regarding patents that are held by Lockheed Martin and Raytheon regarding weather intervention and weather warfare operations that are a huge causative factor to the very adverse aberrant weather conditions that are happening all over the planet, including flooding, drought, atmospheric rivers, etc. Um, it's very insightful and something is going on that is much bigger than just um, carbon footprint, much bigger. Geoengineeringwatch.org and Dane Wigington is, also has a program on KZFC weekly at 8 a.m. and 6 on Saturdays. That's 1080 a.m. Something is not nature's way going on. Thank you. Chris Carter? Aye. And friend? Aye, uh, and thanks for driving all the way up here for that very brief item. At that, we'll conclude all the items on Zone 7, and so we'll uh, close the Zone 7 meeting and move it back to the regular uh, Board of Supervisors meeting, and we're now here for item 8, which is a presentation recognizing members of the community who have participated in the Volunteer Initiative Program, the Sheriff's Volunteer Program, as outlined in the memo of the chair and I'll hand it over to our CAO for the initial remarks and I'll also like to invite up uh, Ms. Delaney and, and Sheriff Hart if you're available. Okay, thank you very much. The Volunteer Initiative Program is a partnership between the Volunteer Center of Santa Cruz and Santa Cruz County. Uh, we match uh, interested community members with volunteer opportunities throughout county government. <coughs> the county is extremely fortunate to have such a dedicated group of volunteers that support our efforts. Uh, we're very pleased to welcome uh, Executive Director of the Volunteer Center, Karen Delaney, and Sheriff Jim Hart. Uh, also with us today is Christina Thurston from the Volunteer Initiative Program. Turning it over to you folks. So sorry, uh, I'm, I'm Christina Thurston with the Volunteer Center of Santa Cruz County. I work with Karen Delaney. Unfortunately, I'm sorry she couldn't make it today. Um, I do have some comments to read on her behalf, but Jim, would you like to start us off? Sure. And just some real brief comments. We, uh, we have about 50 volunteers right now that are working for the Sheriff's Office, really throughout the office, uh, all in our substations. Uh, we have people working in investigations in our coroner's office, in our records division. And with the staffing shortages that I've spoke to all of you about individually and that you're hearing from other county departments, these volunteers come in and give us a lot of hours, thousands of hours in, in total from all the volunteers that help our office run. 
And we're going to recognize three sheriff's office volunteers today who've done a fantastic job. But I also want to acknowledge the, the other 47 uh, that, that come out every week and help us uh, keep our community safe. And then I also want to acknowledge Daisy Aguirre, who is our volunteer program coordinator, who's done a great job post-pandemic. She's getting the, the program back up and running. And our goal was to get to 100 plus volunteers here in the next six months or so. So thank you. And Daisy, thank you. Okay, good. Uh, anyone else before I begin the presentation? Do you guys all good? Okay. <laughs> so good morning. My name is Christina Thurston. I'm the program director for the Volunteer Center um, and the Volunteer Initiative Program. The partnership between the Volunteer Center and the county to engage volunteers within local government for the last 30 years has been an invaluable asset. It is an honor to be part of this amazing group of people um, that we'll be recognizing today. I'm grateful to live in this community full of hardworking people. I know all of you are as well. Um, the people here today have given their time and talent to the community and county volunteer programs that dropped off a lot during the COVID-19 pandemic. This year, almost every single department at the county has interns or volunteers back um, serving. More than 1,000 individuals volunteered in the last 12 months with the county. Um, and they supported flood response and recovery efforts, county parks, cared for animals, just all, all kinds of crucial services. I think the most important thing about the volunteer program here at the county is that bringing community members into our offices, into our departments to work side by side with staff, supporting the work that the staff do every day, it's the best way to improve communication between the community and our local government to really make sure that the concerns of the community are are being heard and addressed and also bringing resources, ideas, support, innovation, interns go on to become staff members once they get their licensing. They also have more um, support from their universities to create innovative programs to try out new things, that flexibility that staff really don't have. And that's really essential to, to the health of our, of our county um, government. Um, and volunteering brings together people from every one of your districts, all walks of life, the people who are really passionate about solving problems that they see, stepping up, helping out, trying to come up with solutions. And they don't often come to make comments or they don't often have their voices heard. So that's why we're really grateful for you guys today recognizing them. Um, what we're going to do is um, I will read the names of the volunteers that are being recognized. Many of them are here today. Um, they'll come up, get their award while the supervisors will be reading about them. Um, and also anyone else who wants to come up. Um, I know the supervisors from the different departments are here as well to, to honor their volunteers. So the first honoree we have today is Lukey, Lucy, sorry, Lucy Wilkinson and Supervisor Koning will read the remarks. Thank you. Lucy, are you here? Come on up. All right. Lucy Wilkinson has been volunteering at the Santa Cruz County Animal Shelter for over a year and has the distinction of being the shelter's most dedicated rabbit volunteer and mentor. <laughs> Lucy helps by cleaning kennels, mentoring new rabbit volunteers, and even takes photos of the rabbits to make sure that only their best angles make it onto the website. <laughs> Lucy is an amazing volunteer who puts time, dedication, and care in attending to some of the smallest and most overlooked furry friends at the animal shelter. Thank you, Lucy, for all that you have done for the staff and for the four-legged residents of the animal shelter. Thank you, Lucy. And I do want to say, sorry for the typo, it's been 10 years that Lucy's been volunteering. <laughs> um, uh, our next honoree, represented by Megan Carroll, is Linda Mathis. Oh, see here. And read by Supervisor Hernandez. I'm so sorry. <laughs> thank you. And, you know, first of all, thank you to the Santa Cruz County Animal Shelter as well. Um, 
Linda Mathis is a volunteer at the Santa Cruz County Animal Shelter and has dedicated herself to making sure that the shelter dogs get the best treatment possible. Not only does she work re regularly work, work, walk the dogs, but she also coordinates with local groomers at Positive Styles to organize monthly grooming days to help the many of the shelter dogs get bathed. Linda also loves taking the dogs to events, showing them off to the public and potential adopters. Linda, you are a vi vital volunteer at the shelter, and we thank you for all the care you have shown to our local canine friends and their humans. <laughs> uh, our next honoree is Judy Appleby. Supervisor Cummings will read the remarks. Judy Appleby is a longtime volunteer at the Santa Cruz County Animal Shelter who comes in weekly to work with cats at the shelter as well as mentor new volunteers. Judy also fosters cats for the shelter which allows them to enjoy a peaceful home away from the shelter and de-stress. Judy gives these cats the love they need to grow and thrive and she is the reason that so many of our cats end up in amazing homes. Along with, being a wonder, along with being wonderful with the animals, Judy's energy is infectious. She brings joy to both clients and staff. Thank you, Judy, for the care that you show to the shelter cats and support you give to the animal shelter. Yay. You can stay if you want, Lucy. So, um, hi, I'm Megan again. I'm volunteer coordinator at the shelter. I'm gonna make this very, very brief. We have over 200 volunteers that do hours every month at the shelter. We are one of the biggest um, volunteer programs. They support our staff, they walk our dogs, they do pretty much almost everything for us. And we're always so thankful for all of their time and energy. We are a community that loves animals and we can tell because we have so many people who wanna work with them. So thank you to all of our volunteers, um, especially Lucy and Judy and Linda, because they're amazing and they go above and beyond. So have a wonderful day and thank you. Okay, our next honoree is Felton Library Friends and the Discovery Park Volunteer Group represented by Janice O'Driscolls today. S Supervisor McPherson will read the remarks. Thank you. And here, oh good. Uh, Felton Library Friends is an incredibly dedicated and active group with more than 25 part participating volunteers that contribute more than 100 volunteer hours per month to support the needs and services of the Felton Library Branch and Discovery Parks. One of the only combinations of such of a library and a discovery park in the nation. Working closely with Santa Cruz County Parks leadership, Felton Library Friends helped to bring the Discovery Park onto the property of the new Felton Library branch. This unique county park promotes environmental literacy through its design and through programs offered by the Santa Cruz County Parks and the Santa Cruz Public Library. Felton Library Friends also helped with the planting of native species as well as the plant identification signage throughout the park. Discovery Park serves as a model and teaching site for students, volunteers, and residents interested in learning about protecting and preserving our natural world. Thank you to Felton Library Friends for all of your hard work and, helping, and for helping to make this wonderful addition to our community. Thank you. I just want to quickly say I am Janice O'Driscoll. I'm president of the Friends of the Santa Cruz Public Libraries. And the Felton chapter is the model chapter for our group. They work very hard to build the wonderful new building they have. They have continued to work and raise money and suggest programs. And they have demonstrated a model program to show how a public library in a county park can work together for the community. Thank you for this recognition. Our next honoree is M Merge Four, represented by Cindy Busenhart today, and Supervisor Friend will read the remarks. Thank you. When the heart of SoCal Park flooded during the January storms of this year, Cindy Busenhart, the CEO and founder of Merge 4, a local sock company, reached out to the County Parks Department to see how Merge 4 could help with the cleanup. Through a partnership with Parks, Cindy and Merge 4 gathered their employees, friends, and families, and together they rolled up their sleeves to help clean up 
the park. Working together, they were able to remove tons of mud and debris from the park, walkways and parking lot, and cleared swales and drain pipes. I want to extend our thanks to Merge Forehead for helping make the Heart of Soquel Park accessible again to the community. Are you wearing the socks? Yeah, of course. Okay. <laughs> Congratulations on your award. Thank you. I actually want to thank uh, Supervisor Manu Koenig for um, a quick little email. We actually just wanted access to water. Um, he introduced us to um, Margaret Ingram, who was awesome, like Margaret was awesome. She rallied not only Parks and Rec, but she rallied Ameritru uh, AmeriCorps, as well as the, as the Santa Cruz uh, Warriors, who actually fed us all. So thinking I just needed water access for all this massive mud that everybody you know, moved, I just wanna say thank you for moving so fast. It was appreciated, thank you. Okay, our next honoree is the Nature Lodge represented by Margaret Ingraham. Supervisor Koenig will read the remarks. The Nature Lodge began volunteering with the Volunteer Center in 2022 and has adopted the East Cliff Parkway to help maintain and improve. They will be hosting regular volunteer days along East Cliff, which will include repainting the keep right signs on the walkway, repainting the red curbs, litter pickup, and weed removal. The Nature Lodge's commitment to the community and county parks is appreciated and we look forward to their beautification efforts along East Cliff Parkway. Our next honoree is the peer support interns represented by Danny Contreras and Supervisor Hernandez will read the remarks. I think Danny may have had to go back to the clinic to work, but maybe he's here. Is uh, there someone taking his place? Supervisor Hernandez, I'll, I'll accept okay. on his behalf, thank you. So the peer support interns have helped improve the county's medication assistance treatment or MAT program by creating flyers for MAT services and performing outreach in the community. They have also facilitated and co-facilitated educational and support groups, as well as worked shifts at the syringe services program. The peer support interns have helped reduce stigma, improve communication, and educate the community and patients on medication assistance treatment. And how to use Narcan literally helps help us save lives. Thank you peer support interns for your support of our MAT program and our community. Intern Colin Webb did come to represent his group. Thanks, Colin. Um, our next honoree is Lauren Spiegel and Supervisor Cummings will read the remarks. All right. Laura Spiegel has been volunteering at the Sheriff's Office since 2018, and she has been a wonderful resource for South County Service Center. She has made it a priority to connect with the community and follow up with issues facing residents in our area. Laura's prior experience has helped her to problem solve and provide resource information for community members. Laura has also volunteered for the child safety program, assisting deputies and presenting the child safety program in elementary schools. Thank you, Laura, for the support you've given to the Sheriff's Department. You're an outstanding volunteer and asset to the community. Just a word, whatever your passion is, um, volunteering for the community is not a choice, it's a responsibility. Our next honoree is Christopher, Christopher Smith and Supervisor McPherson will read the remarks. Thank you. Christopher Smith is being honored today as an outstanding volunteer for his remarkable service to the Santa Cruz Sheriff's Office Missing Persons Unit. Since he began volunteering with the Missing Persons Unit in 2008, Chris's fierce dedication, tireless efforts, and attention to detail have helped make a significant impact to missing person investigations and have helped lift a substantial burden from the patrol personnel. Chris is a shining example of dedicated volunteer who goes above and beyond to make an impact and he is truly deserving of this recognition. Congratulations, Christopher. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I guess as I was sitting here this morning, I had ample time to review why 
it means so much for me to be a volunteer at the Sheriff's Department. When I started in 2008, my sheriff had been preceded by two previous sheriffs, sheriffs that I served. Jim Hart was the invest, uh, uh, investigations lieutenant down at 701 Ocean Street in the corner office. And my desk was a row of boxes outside the coroner's unit because we didn't have enough room. And I guess what I want to comment on is the quality of the people that I have had the opportunity to serve. And like for instance, uh, I'm not sure if he's a deputy or if he's a chief deputy, um, but Chris is over there sitting down. He, I was working for him when he became the coroner's sergeant with absolutely no preparation. That was an experience. So it, it is, if, as a volunteer, I've been a volunteer there 18 years, which is kind of remarkable for me. And, and I think the only reason that I continue there is the quality of the people that I serve. The community, yes, but the people, the deputies, the sergeants that I serve. Thank you. Yes, our final uh, honoree today is Debbie Medina and supervisor friend will read the remarks. Thank you. Last, for the last year, Debbie has been assisting in the Unidentified Persons Project, a collaborative multidisciplinary group with representatives from the coroner, investigations, forensics, Cal DOJ, the FBI, and others. With the genealogy search and identification of persons whose remains have been recovered by the Sheriff's Office, but those remain unidentified using traditional methods. Each case takes hundreds of hours of research combined with careful data mining and organization, and she brings over 40 years of genealogy research experience and passion to the project. Additionally, to assist the office, Debbie has learned how to do genetic genealogy searches, and her research has already led to two positive identifications and she's currently working on a third case. Debbie's contribution and her specialized skills have provided closure for families and the professional staff that work on these cases. Quite remarkable. Thank you, Debbie, for the profoundly important work you do and for helping us never to forget the unidentified victims in our community. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to take the opportunity to um, thank Forensic Service uh, Director Dr. Lauren Zephro for giving me the chance and encouragement to serve my community in this capacity. <clears throat> I've done genealogical research actually for over 50 years, but my um, exposure to the DNA part of that research uh, was limited. So I, I deeply appreciate the opportunity to participate in, in the project that I'm uh, very passionate about. I feel it's very important and, and significant to restore the true identity of these uh, John and Jane Doe's uh, cold cases so that their families may find peace and closure. I also want to pay tribute and thank Deputy Cassandra Galati. Um, I may be Bob the Builder, but she does, <laughs> she provides the finished work. Um, she's been so accommodating and supportive with my calls and questions. Uh, once I texted her uh, last, during the holidays and she, called me um, back and we spoke for probably about an hour, unbeknownst to me that she was on vacation with her family in Utah. Another time I had texted her and she um, called me back and, and we ended up speaking for a couple of hours until about 10 p.m. Um, she's also come over to my house so that we can brainstorm on, on certain areas. So I, I really want to um, um, acknowledge her help for me. And um, she's also very passionate about the work and I'm so grateful to be teamed up with her on these cases. Last, I'd like to acknowledge and thank my husband, Mike of 56 years who could not be here um, this morning for his unfaltering support. He knows that when I say I'm going to Vegas, he doesn't have to pack a bag and he doesn't have to worry about um, 
a gambling debt. <laughs> what it means is that I'm just in the next room for the next couple of days and he won't see me very much. <laughs> but um, he's, he's been very supportive. And with luck, uh, it may be the day that I can um, discover someone's true identity. So thank you again so much for this recognition. Thanks to the board for taking the time to recognize the volunteers today. All the volunteers, thank you so much for your commitment to the community. It really means a lot. The Volunteer Initiative Program office is right next door to the chambers here. So we do have coffee for any volunteers or community members interested in volunteering. Stop by and get a cup of coffee. I would like yeah, to say call. something. Hi everyone, my name is Daisy Aguirre. I'm the volunteer program coordinator at the Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Office. I wanted to take this moment to express my sincere gratitude for all the support that our volunteers provide to the Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Office. Their dedication and commitment to our mission have made a tremendous impact on our community. Whether they're volunteering their time, skills, or resources, their contribution has helped us achieve our goals to make a positive difference in the life in the lives of those we serve. Their selflessness and generosity inspires us all, and we are grateful for their support. Thank you to our volunteers for their countless hours of hard work, their commitment, and their willingness to go above and beyond to make a difference. Their efforts do not go unnoticed, and we cannot accomplish what we do without them. Thank you. Thank you. Just one last final thank you to all the volunteers. We could have one last round of applause for these remarkable people and make our community go around. That will close that item, although there was a clear recruitment pitch for all of you that are not volunteering right now for coffee and snacks next door. Thank you for all your work and we'll move on to item nine. Item nine is a public hearing to consider the petition for rescission of the March 2022 tax sale of the assessor's parcel number APN 07813205, an undeveloped lot located in Ben Lomond, California, as outlined in the memo, the auditor, controller, treasurer, tax collector. We have the board item, the grant deed, the exhibits, uh, the title information, the auction publication, and the public hearing information. Uh, we'll turn it over to our auditor, controller, Treasurer Tax Collector, Ms. Driscoll. Good morning and welcome. Thank you for waiting. Good morning, Chair Friend and members of the board. Edith Driscoll, Auditor Controller, Treasurer Tax Collector. Your board set today, June 27, 2023, as the day to hold a public hearing to consider a petition for rescission of one of the properties sold during the March 2022 defaulted tax sale. The specific property is identified as parcel number 078-13205, as stated, an undeveloped lot located in Ben Lomond, California. The lot has no street address. As outlined in your board packet, the petitioners, Saheed and Nilo Far Tazbagu, are requesting this sale to be set aside in accordance, in accordance with California Revenue and Tax Code Section 3731, as they contend that the sale was not what the sale was improper because as the owners of the property, they did not receive notification of the tax sale. Code section 3731 gives your board guidance on the process for the rescission. One process for when the recent purchaser of the property consents to the rescission and one if the purchaser does not. In this situation, the party who purchased the property, Ms. Lucy Yen, has not given her consent. Therefore, the clerk of the board has provided Ms. Yen with the required notification of this meeting and Ms. Yen has communicated with me via voicemail indicating she has received notice of this hearing. As background for the parcel, the parcel was purchased in 1988 by the Taz Bagu family. The change of ownership was recorded via a grant deed that lists two separate parcel numbers. The first parcel is a developed home site and the second parcel is the one we are discussing today, a vacant land, represented by the Taz Bagu family as the backyard for this parcel. A copy of the grant deed is included as Exhibit 1 in your agenda packet. In 1988, the assessor's office assigned different values to each of the parcels, and beginning in 1989, the two separate annual property tax bills were produced and mailed for these parcels. 
The bills for both parcels were paid in full from 1989 until December 2014, when the vacant parcel first went unpaid. It remained unpaid it was until it was sold at auction in March of 2022. Your board packet includes correspondence from the council representing the Taz Bagu family that states that in 2014, they updated the assessor's office with their new mailing address. The address is located in the Netherlands for both parcels. They believe for both parcels. The Taz Bagu owners received and paid one tax bill for every year starting in 2014 at this new address in the Netherlands, but did not realize that there were two separate parcels as a part of their grant deed and that each had its own tax bill to be paid. As I have presented to your board in the packet, the tax sale was properly conducted pursuant to the California law and all requirements of the auction were met. The documents and narrative presented in your board packet detail specifically the various sections of the California Revenue and Tax Code provisions governing property tax collection and tax auctions, as well as a fact-based review of this matter. As the petitioner is filing their request for rescission, focusing on the notification requirements of the tax sale, I will review those with you now. Code section 3701 of the California Tax and Revenue Code outlines specifically the requirements that must be followed regarding notifications of tax sales. First, after receiving board approval, the tax collector is required to provide notice of the sale. Section 3701 provides that the tax collector shall make a reasonable effort to obtain the names and addresses of all parties of interest for the delinquent properties and to notify those properties by registered or certified mail with return receipt requested at their last known mailing address, if available. My office did that and further, we send these items out FedEx due to inconsistencies recently in the mailing system. Here, the TTC office made reasonable efforts to obtain the last known mailing address of all parties of interest for the parcel. The office searched the assessor recorder's historical records for this specific parcel number and also hired a third party vendor known as Tile Runners Incorporated to locate any other parties of interest. Based on this reasonable search, notifications were mailed timely to all parties of interest. Second, I want to note that the code section also specifically states that the validity of the tax sale shall not be affected if the tax collector's reasonable effort fails to disclose the name and last known mailing address of parties of interest, or if a party of interest has not received the mailed notice. Finally, in addition to mailing certified notices, the tax collector must publish the notice of sale once each week for three consecutive weeks in a newspaper of general circulation published in the county in which the property is situated, which was done both in the Santa Cruz Sentinel and then equally we provide that notification in the Pajaronian. Once the auction has been concluded, the Revenue and Tax Code additionally specifies notice to be given to notify of excess proceeds generated from the sale. The amount of excess proceeds generated from the sale of this property was over $30,000. <clears throat> Excess proceeds are available for potential parties of interest to claim filing procedures set forth in the Revenue and Tax Code. Notification letters were sent to each of the parties of interest previously identified in our process. For the parcel to be required, uh, for this process as required by the provisions of code. And the information was posted in the Santa Cruz Sentinel again for three consecutive weeks. In the case of this parcel, Letters addressed to the petitioner were returned to the county due to incorrect addresses. In hopes of locating any additional addresses for the petitioners to provide this significant amount of money, I requested the assistance of the county's debt collector and collection staff to research any other poten potential addresses. Two additional addresses were located, one in North Carolina and one in the Netherlands. It was the certified letter that was sent to the Netherlands address that was ultimately received by the petitioners. Notwithstanding the treasurer tax collector's position that the sale was conducted properly and lawfully, the decision of whether to rescind the sale is a matter <coughs> for the board to determine, and the treasurer tax collector will implement the direction it receives from your board on this matter. <coughs> this concludes my presentation, and I'm available for questions. Thank you. Are there any questions before we open up this public hearing? 
Uh, seeing none, I would like to open up the public hearing. It's an opportunity we would like to give to the petitioner 10 minutes, if that's uh, doable. I, rep I believe they're represented here by their counsel, Mr. Tarasas. Good morning, Mr. Tarasas. Thank you for waiting. Correct. Uh, good morning, uh, Chairperson Friend and County Board of Supervisors. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, my name is David Tarasas. Um, I represent petitioners Saeed and Nelafar uh, Tashigo. Regarding this petition for rescission of the tax sale of this portion of their property in, at 9671 um, Old Country Road in Ben Lomond, California. It wasn't part of the record, but I did um, want to provide the board with the petition as well as the declaration and cover letter updated that I sent previously. So you'll have that for your decision. So if I could hand that to the board uh, clerk, please. As outlined in the agenda report, the description of this parcel is a single property at 9671 uh, Old Country Road. It includes two APNs, so if you look at the deed of the property, it is a single uh, description. The um, parcel um, tax uh, notices were sent to um, my client's brother-in-law in Los Gatos, California. When he passed on about um, December 2014, the address was changed and my client contacted the county and updated the address with their uh, mailing address in the Netherlands. Um, beginning in December of 2014, January 2015, all tax notices for the property um, for this parcel were sent to their home in the Netherlands. And then in April 2015, the um, my client confirmed the address change um, by taking a screenshot of the assessor's web page, which shows the full description of the property, 19.9 acres. Um, he used that as verification, one, that he was making payments for all taxes owed on this property and continued to do so for the next seven years. Um, again, after uh, prior to the death um, of his brother-in-law, the taxes were paid from the Las Gatos address, and that's what prompted the address change that's noted in the record in, in December 2014, January 2015. In any event, this April 2015 notice is what I'm referring to, provides that verification that my client relied on moving forward that the addresses had been changed. I'd like to also point out that um, when my client received notice. Um, it wasn't from the county. They initially received notice from one of their family members in April of 2022 that there was this, uh, a firm that was looking for unclaimed funds. Um, one of the brother-in-laws, and you'll look in the declaration of Syed, which I've attached to your record, contacted him in the Netherlands, and then Syed contacted the county staff to ask them what happened. And at that point, um, we believe that the county updated the address for the vacant parcel that um, we're speaking of today. It is not reasonable that the county couldn't have checked the records. They could have seen that there was an address affiliated with the, uh, the parcel with the home on it so that one, notices could have been sent out to Mr. Saeed in, uh, Mr. Tashagu in uh, the Netherlands. Also, it doesn't show that there was any indication that anyone visited the property. I know that the, uh, the description is that there was no physical address affiliated with this property, but it is part of a larger parcel, 19.9 acres, that was included in the tax records that were on file with the county. So other than mailing the notices to um, an outdated address, there was no other indication that there was any further investigation that this property done. And in fact, after they hired a collector, it showed that you know, they did have record of the Netherlands address, um, as was mentioned here. So once my client learned about the, uh, the sale, he took diligent attempts to address the matter directly with staff and also working with the alleged buyer of the property. Um, one, my client made uh, attempts to not only um, communicate directly with uh, Ms. Yin, who uh, ultimately purchased the property at this tax sale, but also took other actions to, one, protect his interest in the property moving forward, which has resulted in this hearing. So Saeed and Nilafort Tashigu respectfully request that the Board of Supervisors authorize the rescission of the 2022 sex tax sale based on the aforementioned comments and based on their reasonable actions and due diligence that they took to update their contact information and for making timely payment of taxes. 
as he's outlined in his uh, declaration, uh, my client is prepared to pay for any past due tax assessments that are owed. They amounted to about $7,000 over these seven years. It's a modest amount and it, that was included in the board record within 15 days of notice. And um, Mr. Uh, Saeed Tashigu is on, on uh, available remotely. If there's any further questions you have regarding this uh, timeline or any questions you have. Unfortunately, um, his daughter, who is also referenced in his declaration, had to log off based on the length of the meeting, but she is not available. But if there are further questions, I'd, I'd be happy to address them. Thank you, Mr. Truss. Thank you for being here today. Is there anybody from the um, purchasers represented today? Madam Clerk, is there anybody online that appears to be representing the purchasers during this public hearing? I'm not seeing anyone um, pertaining to the purchaser. Okay. Um, is there anybody in the community that would like to address us during this public hearing in chambers? Is there anybody online that would like to address us? Yes, we do have hearing? a speaker online. <clears throat> Call in user two, your microphone's now available. Marilyn I read through the packet and I was actually surprised at this information. It's important to know, John, I'm reading from page 25, that the validity of a tax sale quote shall not be affected if the tax collector's reasonable effort, who determines that, that's my part, fails to disclose the name and last known mailing address of parties of interest, or if a party of interest does not receive the mailed notice, section 3701. It seems to me there needs to be mail notices, and it sounds like the county was negligent in uh, not mailing it to the correct um, address. The other part of this, I haven't heard so good, pardon me, I'm moving these pages, is that it says the document provided to the assessor recorder in 2014, I'm reading page 29, has since been destroyed. So it cannot be reviewed for verification as to what was or wasn't requested. requested. Why are documents being destroyed? And I noticed that item 25 in today's agenda has $50,000 for off-site document destruction services. These documents need to be preserved as is evidence here. And also, it seems like you're destroying evidence when you're destroying documents. And I think related, I have said it submitted probably hundreds of documents over 20 years on the dangers of cell towers and quoting science. Thank, thank you, Ms. Garrett. Thank you, Ms. Garrett. Is there anybody else online for this public hearing? We have no further speakers, Chair. Okay, confirming there's nobody additional in chambers. Seeing none, I will close the public hearing and bring it back to the board. Uh, just my thoughts on this. I, I do believe that uh, the auditor controller, the treasurer tax collector in this instance uh, did everything according to code. I also believe that this is a unique circumstance. So I'm comfortable with the rescission request on this, but I don't see any flaw in the work that was done by you or your team in regards to this. This is just a very unique situation with where the homeowners live. Uh, and, and various other things, but I'd be open to hearing what my colleagues believe on this as well. Yeah, th thank, you, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, I do agree. Um, having held the public hearing, um, I, I would I want to move the recommended action and grant the petition and related actions as outlined within uh, recommended action two, 
And I do want to repeat what you said. And even though uh, I have made this motion, I want to acknowledge that I think our auditor controller's office handled this issue properly. However, uh, we can also acknowledge the difficulties that was uh, involved in this situation. But uh, congratulations on a job well done under some um, different types of circumstances. But I would move the recommended action. So we have a motion for rescission. Is there a second? I'll second. We have a second from Supervisor Cummings. Is there additional discussion? See, yes, please. Yeah, I'll just um, echo the comments of my colleagues and acknowledge the work that was done by the um, our tax controller's office. Um, I will also say, you know, it seems like this is a, sit a situation where there might have been, you know, over time some challenges in getting information to the different parties because it's obvious that before 2014 they've been paying their taxes and then after 2014 they're making enough to pay taxes on one property but for whatever reason they weren't able to make payments on both at the same time and so um, it seems like something that you know is a unique situation as has been brought up and hopefully we can resolve this so that moving forward they'll be able to get all the tax information they need um, so that they can pay their uh, taxes on time and I do want to appreciate that they've the, the willingness to you know pay the back taxes within 15 days I think it really does go to show that um, somewhere there was a hiccup along the way but they are willing to uh, resolve this and I think it's um, I appreciate the board's support for moving in this direction as well we have a motion and a second if we got a roll call please supervisor Koenig aye friend aye Cummings aye Hernandez aye and McPherson aye that item passes unanimously. Thank you both to the treasurer, tax collector, as well as Mr. Trostas for taking the time. Uh, we'll move on to item 10, which is to consider approval and authorization of submission to the proposed Mental Health Services Act MHSA innovation plan to fund the crisis now for a term of July 1st, 2023 to June 30th, 2026, with an option to extend through June 30th, 2028, pending MHSA legislative direction to the Mental Health Services Oversight and Accountability Commission and take related actions as outlined in the memo of the Director of Health Services. We have the board memo, the crisis now draft and the innovation plan. And with us today, we have our director of HSA, Monica Morales. We have Ms. Kern, the deputy director of behavioral health division. And we also have Mr. Russell, the director of access and crisis services with the behavioral health direction division, excuse me. Uh, Ms. Morales, welcome. Thank you, board. Um, I know it's been a long meeting and I appreciate you guys, you know, just taking time to listen to us today. We believe we have an opportunity in front of you that we wanna, you know, showcase to you. and obviously um, ideally get your support to move forward with it. We know that we are um, in very difficult, uh, you know, circumstances right now when it comes to behavioral health. Over and over, we've been sharing reports with you or with the sales office and with other stakeholders about the need for, um, you know, crisis services in our community. We've seen an increase in depression, anxiety, suicide, overdose and specifically the dire need of uh, supporting our youth with behavioral health needs. Um, there's also no question that we are struggling with our workforce. It's nationally, it's statewide, and it's locally. Um, not to mention the level of reform <coughs> that we're going through because of new policy at the state and federal level, all obviously to lead us into better services for our community. Um, we have done a magnificent job here in Santa Cruz, believe it or not, in terms of the services that we do have. Um, in many ways, we, for example, have two county uh, mental health clinics. We have mobile services available. We have a crisis stabilization uh, program in a 16-bed uh, psychiatric facility. And that's a lot compared to what other counties have. However, we know that work really still is needed. We know that we need to align these services better. We know that we need to make sure that we're coordinating with our community partners. And that's why we think it's a great opportunity for us to move forward with the Crisis Now model that we're about to showcase um, with you. The Crisis Now model really is evidence-based, promising practice as well that's really helping counties piece all of these services together if you have them and if you don't have them to actually build them. And there's four key components. I'm just gonna summarize them really quick, but it's really thinking about a 24 hour call center. It's thinking about a crisis stabilization services, uh, our mobile unit and our residential and trying to create a seamless system for our residents when they're in care. 
Um, the benefits for us, as you can imagine, are just better alignment, uh, quicker services and availability of services, scaling these hours and the number of services that we have in our community. Um, and most importantly for us is, you know, trying to um, build a system so we can also focus on mild and prevention and moderate care that we need. We're focusing a lot in crisis because that's what we have right now, a dire need. But there's also going upstream. And at some point, we'll have a conversation in September and August about those pieces. But I'm very proud of our team. Uh, they've gone out of the way, as you can tell, with little staff in place to really, they're one of the five counties that's receiving this technical assistance to move forward with this pilot. So kudos to them for just taking that extra effort despite all of the different challenges that we have going on for us. I'll turn it out to Deputy Director Karen Kern and James to ch just really give you guys an update on the details of the model. <coughs> Thanks, Director Morales. Um, Good morning, uh, Chair Friend and Supervisors. Thanks for having us here today. I'm Karen Kern. I'm the direct, uh, Deputy Director of Behavioral Health. With me is my colleague, James Russell, who is our Director of Access and Crisis Services. And we're going to talk to you today about our plan to improve and expand on our behavioral health services to people experiencing crisis with an MHSA innovation project. Um, we'll lay out our current state, what we've learned about our community needs and process gaps, uh, how we think we can improve our process and response into the future. Mental Health Services Act innovation component is designed to change some aspect of the public behavioral health system and to evaluate the effectiveness of a new or changed practice or strategy in the field of mental health with a primary focus on learning and process change um, rather than directly filling a program gap or need. Uh, innovation plans are funded through MHSA, California's Prop 63 funding, which comprises about 19% of our total behavioral health budget. Um, the current rules allow us to spend 5% of this county's distribution on an innovation project, and that's an average of roughly $1.9 million per year over the next three years that we're looking at. This project is designed to improve the way we provide care by changing the current process and taking a different approach towards how we align continuum services to work better together and develop a recovery pathway for people in crisis. Oops. Um, just to uh, give a brief overview of our current state, uh, as we strive to support community serious behavioral health needs, we've averaged a 28% vacancy rate. Uh, you heard many people come today and talk about that. Um, over the past year, it amounts to about 75 employees across the agency, which includes uh, administrative positions, but mostly clinical and clinical leadership roles. Uh, it's presented a challenge in service capacity and timeliness. In the year before COVID, we served over 7,000 people, um, and we're down to about 5,500 now in our, uh, at our community clinics, or I'm sorry, our county clinics. Uh, this mirrors the shortage uh, of our community providers in Santa Cruz County and as Director Morales mentioned, uh, across the state and the nation. Uh, today, the innovative, innovative plan that we're discussing um, will take into account mitigating risk, risk with workforce gaps and seeking to uh, support timely and seamless services. Our current crisis continuum is composed of two mobile response team, one of which uh, corresponds with law enforcement, the behavioral health unit on SoCal operated by telecare, which offers 12 chairs for crisis stabilization and 16 beds in a psychiatric health facility and inpatient unit. And then our 988 call center, which offers uh, at the moment uh, crisis de-escalation crisis de support to anyone who feels they're in a crisis or have a loved one in crisis. About 2% of those 3,000 calls coming into 988 last year resulted in the need for a referral for immediate mobile crisis response. So somebody who is meeting the criteria for potential for 5150 or 5585 hold. Um, and then usually those responses were by uh, a mental health liaison uh, responding with law enforcement. County Behavioral Health also offers 24 seven uh, after hours on-call support for people in our system of care or people who are interested in information uh, about our services or how they might be able to get help. So anybody could call. We have a call center that calls an on-call person. 
Um, and then we also have walk-in crisis services at both our Emmeline and Freedom campuses, Monday through Friday, 8 to 4. Uh, we share care in treating our community with behavioral health needs with the Central Coast Alliance for Health, or the Alliance, who administers the county managed care plan and works with those folks who are experiencing mild to moderate mental illness. Uh, our county mental health plan works with those experiencing serious mental illness. <coughs> To better understand the barriers facing people in mental health crisis in our community, we've been meeting with our community partners, our hospital EDs, our law enforcement partners, and other agencies in the crisis continuum every other week since October, really reviewing uh, data, trying to hear people's experience, um, uh, what needs improvement, where are the pain points, um, and then assessing gaps. And our um, primary problems that we've discovered through that can be seen on the next slide. So we've identified gaps in available services, especially for youth. Um, restrictive admission criteria at our crisis stabilization program, including COVID testing and uh, medical clearance criteria, limited mobile crisis capacity, and really trying to get out there um, more hours, later hours, 24-7. Um, the presence of law enforcement, which isn't always needed uh, in a crisis response. Um, uncoordinated system with silos, and then the workforce challenges that have been referenced. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit now about uh, the data in the next several slides. Um, we're going to review the data that's been driving our decision making over the past year. First, we'll share some data that reflects uh, the mobile crisis teams and their response. And then we'll share data that shows challenges with our receiving center, which is the telecare crisis stabilization unit. Uh, in this slide here, you're looking at the services provided by our mobile crisis teams, the mobile emergency response team and mobile emergency response team for youth, which we call MERT or MERTI, and the mental health liaisons over the past three years. Um, MERT and MERTI calls are represented in the blue, and then the mental health liaisons are in the orange. Um, just as a reminder, the liaisons correspond with law enforcement for, those, um, for most of the time. We saw a drop in calls in uh, 2021 with COVID. Uh, many people were isolating, uh, sheltering in place, and so we didn't see the same response as we had before or the same need. Um, and uh, it's increased over the past couple of years. Um, final volume for this call year, we estimated the actual, which is actually through the end of May, estimated through the end of June. And then it's worth noting that the mental health liaison data represents a subset of the calls they do get. Um, that we have mental health liaisons in three jurisdictions with Watsonville PD, with Santa Cruz PD and with our sheriff's office. Uh, and they receive combined over 2,000 calls. Many of those they're able to uh, resolve without actually going out. Uh, the data here represents uh, our 5150s, and the number of people who have 5150, 5150 is the hold code for adults who are experiencing mental health crisis where they're a danger to self, danger to others, or gravely disabled. Um, this data represents the number of people over the past three calendar years who have self-presented or been diverted to Dominican Hospital's emergency department on a 5150 hold. As more people have uh, presented or diverted to the emergency departments over the past two years, County Behavioral Health has made MERT staff available to go into the emergency department and reassess people on that hold within that first 24 hours to determine whether the hold can be lifted and uh, referrals can be made, service can be provided without actually hitting that crisis level at the CSP <coughs> or the uh, inpatient unit. Um, and you can see that we had, over the past three years, a significant increase in the number of people at Dominican. And that's partly due to um, the, the diversion from our CSP due to staffing challenges there, and I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but you can see also in the blue bar the number of people that MERT was able to reassess, lift the hold, and then support with referrals, and, uh, referrals into community services and safety plans, avoiding hospitalization. So this next slide um, talks about or shows the average number of monthly admissions to our crisis stabilization at Telecare from when it opened in 2016 until the current year. Um, the CSP is generally a less than 24 hour stay uh, and, and one of the 12 chairs provided for people as they're being assessed and stabilized. So that's your first step into a crisis stabilization unit. We saw the most significant drop in admissions last year, which um, also reflected in the number of people diverted to our emergency rooms. 
that we saw on the last slide. Um, telecare has had significant staffing challenges, um, the, the, uh, especially with nursing and licensed mental health clinicians. Um, they, uh, regulations require a minimum of, you know, a minimum ratio of one licensed clinician to every four people that are being served in that capacity or in that yeah, crisis capacity. And so if one staff is, one shift is unfilled, then that re effectively reduces our 12 chairs to eight and thereby diverting people to the emergency departments. It's a significant problem. Um, this has adversely impacted our ability to serve people at this level of care. And then um, for context, um, we just looked at average monthly admissions to the C CSP over the last three quarters in 2002, when telecare had that lowest capacity to see where the the majority of the referrals were coming from. And you can see Dominican Hospital had the majority followed by the Sheriff Office and then Santa Cruz PD. Uh, and then the other two main agencies um, with the uh, Watsonville Community Hospital and Watsonville PD made those referrals. Um, and then the data for law enforcement that you see here do include those that are combined with the mental health liaisons. <coughs> my notes, sorry. This slide is representing the diversion rate. And so the reason that this is important is that when we started getting together in October and meeting with our community partners, mostly law enforcement and our, uh, our emergency department staff, um, what we were hearing is, you know, there's been a, a huge influx of people presenting it to the emergency departments in crisis and why aren't they being served at the CSP? And so we started measuring actually those diversion rates in, um, in November. And you can see here, the orange bars represent youth, the blue bars represent adults. Um, what this is saying is that in November, 88% of youth who were in crisis and presented to the crisis stabilization program were actually diverted due to the lack of uh, capacity available for them. And then 48% for adults. So we worked uh, really closely with telecare to try to improve those numbers. Um, we, we call this code red when people are, diversion, are diverting. So we started measuring the code red rate. Um, as I mentioned before, staffing is, is really critical. So that one to four ratio uh, with the way that the current structure of the CSP, the, the actual facility is designed. Uh, they've got one room with four chairs that can be flexed for youth or adults. However, if there's one youth in one of those chairs, then it takes effectively three chairs offline for adults because we're un unable to uh, put youth and adults together. So it's just it, the design of the facility coupled with the staffing challenges is just perfect storm, right? Um, we were able to work with Telecare to increase their funding, um, to make the positions a little bit more attractive and also to restructure the way they were staffed um, with the nursing and the licensed social workers and they were able to fill some of those um, staffing positions. And then also they brought on some stable leadership, which truly helped. And I really appreciate that. Um, the two people, Dr. AC Folks, who is our administrator currently at Telecare, uh, both over the crisis stabilization unit and over the um, psychiatric health facility. And then um, Laura Yellen. Yellen, thank you, <laughs> who is the CSP director. And both of them are working very closely with us to try to close these gaps and improve this. Um, the other thing I just really want to mention is during the atmospheric rivers, uh, when we have a lot, of, a lot of people in our county services as well as in our community partners live out of county, um, and during atmospheric river period between December and February or so, uh, when staff were unable to get into Santa Cruz to work, telecare put up staff in hotels locally on their own dime to make sure that they were staffed. So I just want to mention that here, keep things going. Okay, so diving into a little bit more about the Crisis Now project, we've been working with a representative from Recovery Innovations International who helped us assess our current system of um, provisions of services, <clears throat> excuse me, using the Crisis Now lens for what we have and what we need. Um, basically, we have some limited capacity around mobile crisis response already in place. Um, we have a 988 call center with some capability for um, referral. And we have some receiving center capacity with our existing CSP. Um, we also utilize suicide prevention best practices. And obviously not on here, excuse me, <clears throat> is that we have a really good staff base to start off with, dedicated staff. 
and dedicated partners in our system. What we need though is, is a consistent 24-7, 365 mobile crisis response, a call center with dispatch solutions directly to mobile crisis teams, dedicated receiving crisis support for youth, and peer support specialists integrated into the model. In a, adopting the crisis now as our innovation project, we're able to build on national standards, which our consultant RI International played a part in formulating. We'll be able to meet state mandates and leverage various um, funding opportunities during the initial three-year period of this project, while identifying sustainable funding for a successful and vital continuum of services. This model also dovetails with the road with the roadmap to the ideal crisis system endorsed by our mental health advisory board. And it provides the flexibility in adapting to local needs and integration with existing programs and services. Put simply, crisis now is someone to call, someone to respond, and somewhere safe to go to, um, coupled with evidence-based practices informing our policies and procedures for a seamless network of services. Is this thing, oh. Well, we're just gonna outlive here. <laughs> so in implementing crisis now, County Behavioral Health will be utilizing um, RI International as a consultant, which will provide project management, um, ongoing assessment of our services, and provide guidance on next steps for improving our crisis continuum, as well as training and technical assistance for our behavioral health leadership team and crisis responders. We already have identified several gaps in services and have taken steps to address these, as Karen mentioned previously, such as a dedicated youth CSU and crisis residential program, which is currently being developed at 5300 SoCal Avenue and will be integral to our um, overall continuum of services. Our crisis now model will help us evaluate the best standards and integration of these services within our continuum in order to provide the best interventions for individuals and families utilizing these services with the goal of long-term recovery. The Crisis Now project will also assist us in identifying and planning for other projects and services that are needed to better serve those experiencing behavioral health crisis, such as additional adult crisis step downs and alternative <laughs> 5150 placements um, and hospitalization, which are the most intrusive and um, costly of interventions. So. We'll be uh, looking at, um, in terms of enhancing our crisis continuum, probably the single most identified and talked about aspect of the continuum is the need for 24-7, 365 mobile crisis response. Not only do we hear this from the community, but current state mandates for 24-7 non-law enforcement behavioral health mobile crisis response, as well as new grants and enhanced Medi-Cal billing opportunities are only given when the mobile crisis response are operational 24-7, 365. With this in mind, the Crisis Now project will enable us to take steps towards expanding our mobile crisis response services. This will include a systematized non-law enforcement, except when circumstances warrant, behavioral health response that will respond when and where the crisis is occurring. This will take the guesswork out of who to call, how to call, and when to call that we feel that our community is currently facing. Am I on the right side? I got lost. Next one. Okay. So we want to spend, um, again, focusing on the mobile crisis response aspect of this. Within this Crisis Now Innovations project, we'll have flexibility to build on our existing MERT, MERTI, and mental health liaison teams while partnering with a community-based organization to provide additional response services and staffing. County Behavioral Health will provide clinical staffing, while CBO will provide non-licensed behavioral health interventionists, certified peer support specialists, and EMTs. Once fully implemented, we are proposing a three-level response. The level one response would be a combination of either a behavioral health interventionist, certified peer, and or EMT. These responders will provide basic assessment, crisis intervention, and safety planning without the 5150 or 5585 um, application um, authority. Level two response will include a county behavioral health licensed clinician or um, licensed eligible clinician with a non-licensed partner who can provide clinical support to the level one team and 5150-5585 assessment and hold placement. The level three response takes into account safety factors and would be a co-response with local law enforcement along with either a level one or level two team. We're also looking at a um, three-phase implementation. So we're not looking at boom, we're just gonna have this overnight. Um, as you've already heard about staffing and uh, other things, we're looking at how can we ramp these services up. 
um, we're looking to um, a phased implementation will be dependent on our ability to hire and retain staff. In phase one, we're um, proposing to partner up our existing clinicians and two person teams, enabling a team response to calls without law enforcement or a co-response with law enforcement with safety considerations indicate. We'll continue to meet um, our agreements with our, our current MHL mental health liaison um, agreements with law enforcement, as well as continue to provide specialized response to schools and families with our Murdy North and Murdy South teams. Um, moving on to phase two, we'll implement phase two once our CBO partner comes on board and can field staff. This will enable us to partner these staff with our county behavioral health clinicians for training and quality improvement around crisis response services. Once CBO staff and CBO county behavioral health staffing are solidified, we can then move to phase three in a 24 hour um, a day operation. Within the context of this innovation project, this phased implementation will include the ongoing support of our consultant, RI International, with whom we will, we, we will identify the appropriate staffing and logistics to provide services countywide with an eye on sustainability for the program. RI International will also assist in formulating appropriate policy and procedures for field-based response with an eye on safety and incorporating peer support into our teams. The Crisis Now model cons considers the entire crisis continuum of services as well as other existing services. Part of the project will include weaving these crisis continuum services as seamlessly as possible, including potential for cross-referral with the focused intervention team, downtown outreach workers, HOPES, Healing the Streets, and Homeless Persons Health Project, among others, to provide improved engagement with service providers and ultimately better recovery outcomes for the people in crisis. We'll maintain dedicated MERDI response to both North and South County during school days and build on partnerships with all school districts to enhance the behavioral health care of our county's youth. This innovation project will also seek to continue building on and improving the working relationships with all the partners within our crisis continuum, including, excuse me, municipalities, emergency departments, law enforcement, and behavioral health providers. So our current, oh, our current budget for this project comes in just under the 5% allotment of our MHA distribution we allowed by the state. Um, we're just allowing some wiggle room. It's, you know, we get forecasts twice a year on our MHSA distribution. It fluctuates depending on economic conditions. And so we just want to make sure that we've got some wiggle room in there. Um, uh, RI International will be assisting us with this project management plan development. Um, as well as the Crisis Now Continuum Assessment. And then MHSA also requires independent evaluation of each project. So we will be evaluating both process and outcomes with this project. With this project. Uh, we're looking at uh, reducing repeated cycles through the crisis system, uh, reducing reliance on hospital systems and law enforcement, improving clinical outcomes of the people we serve, reducing justice involvement for people experiencing mental health issues and just reducing the overall reliance on the high cost crisis services. Um, where these service improvements will be a great start towards solid outcomes, parallel work on our behavioral health system and care will need to take place, including additional residential treatment beds, uh, higher levels of outpatient care, uh, shelter or housing with behavioral health supports. All of those are also key components for this. Um, as previously stated, the innovation funds are meant to improve the processes in our behavioral health system of care with new strategies and not meant to actually fund services. So we need to figure out how to sustain the services long term. There is significant investment by the state currently in crisis services with the CalAIM in, uh, initiatives and the crisis care uh, mobile unit initiatives. So uh, we'll be looking at leveraging those. We did receive a crisis care mobile unit grant and are currently in the process of uh, reorganizing ourselves to manage the uh, Medi-Cal reform fee-for-service changes to the payment system. Um, we're also looking to reduce siloed care and improve efficiency by maximizing those billable services and then again releasing, reducing reliance on those high cost uh, crisis services, which as Director Morales, is, Morales said in her opening remarks, um, will uh, we'll need to go upstream and really look at um, preventative measures and other interventions to keep people out of crisis. And so really the key takeaways here is that we're looking to develop this dynamic crisis continuum. We wanna address the local needs. Um, 
the, the collaboration with existing partnerships is key. Uh, the, the current system is somewhat siloed, so we want to make sure that we're integrating the services and providing those seamless pathways, pulling everybody into it. Um, we want to make sure that we get the staged approach to the 24-7, 365 crisis response so that regardless of what time of day somebody's in crisis, we're able to provide somebody that can go to them and help resolve that crisis and then ensure that we're utilizing those evidence-based practices and national standards. And then any questions? Thank you for the presentation. Uh, turn it over to my colleagues. I, I know that you had made a comment earlier that you had some questions. So please, uh, Supervisor Cummings. Thank you, Chair. I just want to thank you all for your hard work on this. I know for years I've been hearing from folks in the community about how we need more, you know, crisis response. We need 24-7 crisis response. And it's great to see that we're moving in that direction as a county. And hopefully we can you know, make this something that's sustainable and ongoing uh, that can help serve many people in our community who are uh, struggling with mental illness and are under distress. Um, I had a couple questions. I guess my first one, I know that, um, and I'm just going to use the city of Santa Cruz as an example, but I know that um, the city of Santa Cruz was one um, jurisdiction that was also interested in exploring this. And so I'm just kind of wondering about what potentials there are for collaboration and how we can use those types of collaborations to leverage more funding um, to expand these services to um, other parts of the county. Um, I know Karen can go into detail, but our intent has always been to have a county-wide system. We believe that's better for our constituents. They won't get confused. You have one system in place, and we don't have competition in terms of investments. I know our team has been talking to the city um, about trying to align, and so I'll kick it to Karen to kind of give you some of those details. Karen's going to kick it to me. <laughs> um, I think that what, what, what this allows is, because we've been meeting with the city, um, my team has, and it allows for us to, to weave together different options as, as we're building this up. It, it definitely does not put us into this, oh, this is how you have to do it. The Crisis Now model gives us, hey, what are the systemic needs that we have throughout our county? Um, as Director Morales is referring to, we want a countywide response, though, that is equally available to everyone throughout the jurisdictions, um, but it definitely can have some tailored approaches to different municipalities. And the other thing I will add is each municipality has a different set of needs, right? And so you want to make sure that the, the system is flexible enough to respond to whatever the need happens to be. Right. Thanks. And then um, I know that earlier in the year we've been um, contacted by um, some of the schools, the, um, the um, County Office of Education and also Santa Cruz City Schools and just seeing that, you know, some of what they had brought up in those meetings around trying to have more availability of crisis response for youth at the schools. I was wondering if you could speak to how that fits into this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we've had various meetings with our schools, um, specifically, as you mentioned, we're working with the Department of Education in Santa Cruz City, but also um, bringing them all together, including our uh, providers like Encompass and PBPSA, to have discussions on how we can get to these areas of mild, moderate, and for me, the prevention pieces. I will be sharing with you guys, we're working on a roadmap right now. We're identifying what are the key gaps that we have in the continuum. We're working towards that MOU that we all wanted to put in place with the County Office of Education in the county. All of those efforts, I'm very excited to let you know. We've had probably about six to um, seven meetings, I think, by now. So we'll be coming to you later in the fall to present on, you know, where are we going, where are we, and very similar to this, but more on the youth and mild to moderate um, angles. Thanks, appreciate that. And then um, my last question, and it's, it's kind of a funding related. I'm just, this just came to mind when you all were wrapping up and talking about the Cal AIM. But I guess, you know, with the movement in this direction in terms of being able to have ongoing funding, is there an opportunity for the county potentially to, for example, if you, if we sent out Murdy and they engage with the youth, who has, whose family has health insurance so we could bill through them. And for those who don't, being able to bill through Medi-Cal as a way of kind of having ongoing funding. I'm just wondering if that may be an option potentially. The, the state is currently looking at in conjunction with AB 988 and some other um, things that they're maneuvering, uh, parity with um, private health insurance where we, there is a potential for the crisis response um, that we would be able to bill to those private insurers. So yes. Great, thanks. Thank you.
Uh, Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you guys for finally bringing this forward. I think I've been asking for a 24 seven crisis response since day one of taking office. And uh, I'm glad that you finally identified a way to fund uh, the program and begin implementation. If you talk to any one of our first responders or a lot of community members, it's very clear that we need this in our community. And um, I'm really excited that it's finally happening. I also wanna thank the Mental Health Advisory Board. I know they've been consistently beating the drum uh, for the need for this and, and moving us towards it. Um, and I know they played no small part in identifying uh, you know, the roadmap to ideal crisis system and um, I think also helping you know, find the, the right consultant to work with on this. Um, my first question is, you know, you know, we heard earlier today about the, the challenge with vacancies. Uh, looking at the budget for this, it seems like three quarters of it is for kind of system improvement and the consultants to help us do that. And I, and I think the consultants, I'm sure they're great. They you know, clearly they work on a project in Phoenix, Arizona, made great progress there. They have a lot of experience doing this. Um, but are we gonna have enough people to, enough mental health workers, enough clinicians to actually bring it to fruition? And is there anything in the budget that gives us confidence that we will be able to hire these five positions, whereas you know we've struggled in the past on others? So I, you want to? I was just gonna say that what, um, what I love about the design of this model is that it, it doesn't, it's not completely reliant on licensed clinicians to run. So there are some services that um, a non-licensed individual with training could, uh, could provide to de-escalate. For example, having a peer go out with an EMT, a lot of calls that uh, our staff go on are actually, there's sometimes a medical concern or it starts as a medical concern and then mental health is. So having somebody that is also trained in those medical uh, supports would be really helpful in those. Um, and then the other piece is having peer support on board. Um, peers, we're, we're in the process right now of bringing peer certification to Santa Cruz County. It also is a process and it'll take a little bit of time, but uh, we're hoping to build that peer workforce. And once those peers are certified, they're an invaluable resource because they're people with lived experience who are often more easily trusted by the individual in crisis than one of us might be. Uh, and so the, you know, in building that workforce, I think it'll help mitigate the risk of not finding licensed people who seems to be our, our biggest challenge. Yeah. Thanks for that Thank clarification. You. I mean, I'm glad that there was kind of a subtext of that in here that we were going to expand the, um, I don't know, scope of people that were going to be responding. Is there some target number of um, those kinds of you know, peers or others that will assist in the response that we're looking to recruit? I mean, like whatever it is, 20, peer responders or? I'd say initially we're looking to recruit approximately 12 people yeah. and up to 24. And again, it depends on a, uh, the process improvement piece of really looking at the data and seeing how many people do we need to staff after hours. You know, we know that between eight and eight is when most crises tend to occur. How many teams do we have to field to safely get them to different areas of the county? Um, you know, again, we know that during daytime hours uh, when that Highway 1 corridor is plugged up, we need at least three teams in mm -hmm. this county to, mm -hmm. to respond adequately and in a timely manner to someone in crisis. After hours, um, nighttime hours, um, when the traffic burden is not there, we could probably get almost anywhere in the county within 20 to 30 minutes. So again, it's looking at um, the, the total data piece of what we're looking to, to staff. Okay. Yeah, and it's gonna be conditional upon how many staff we can actually bring on board to how fast we can ramp up. But this gives us many more avenues. Um, I also would put out there that, you know, at one time Santa Cruz was leading the way in mobile crisis response. Uh, Mer Merdy were pretty uh, innovative programs. Mental health liaison program was innovative. This gives us the chance to once again, kind of get on that cutting edge and we can look at how can we develop a culture of crisis responders all the way from our 988 call center um, to the CBO responder, to the county response, where we're integrating into the different um, MSW programs and bringing uh, practicums and internships in that are again, cutting edge and really leading the way in this crisis response. Got it. And as far as the salaries outlined for folks that we, the additional um, clinicians we hope to hire, is that, I mean, I assume that's the same as sort of all the other open positions we have today. So if you know, we get a year into this and we're, I mean, 
we're, we're still having struggling to hire. I mean, we'll have to address that sort of yeah. across the entire department, right? Uh, we're, uh, we're not going to sugarcoat the situation. The data speaks for itself. We have trouble recruiting. I mean, we have anywhere between 25 to 30 percent in behavioral health, depending on the classification. Um, what this model presents, though, is a vision of where we want to go and where we need to go. Um, we cannot have a vision and, you know, think that everything else is going to follow. We know we're going to have challenges. We know we have to also put the same effort in terms of the recruitment. And so there's, um, as I presented to you, I think at the last meeting, we're trying different things. When it's hard to fill positions, we're trying to assess for salary increases. Um, we're trying to also leverage state and federal opportunities to um, do loan forgiveness, right? But again, it's not general fund, but it's us, our team in the department going out of our way to try to find ways to basically um, entice people to work for us. We have a long way, but you know, that's gonna take us five years probably to kind of level sit and we cannot afford to hold this model until we're fully staffed. We have to chase both at the same time. Definitely. I mean, I agree. This model should be our North Star. And I also want to acknowledge that there were a number of items on today's agenda that addressed recruiting for healthcare workers. So I appreciate your efforts there. Um, just a couple more quick questions. Um, first is, will 911 be able to refer to the mobile crisis unit? I mean, I know 988 is not like that much harder, but everyone knows 911. And I don't know where we're at in the community on 988, maybe like 20%. You know, right now, what we have is, is you know, you call the 800 number for MERT at the county. You got 988, and then you can get pushed over to 911, or you call 911 for a law enforcement response with a mental health liaison. What we're looking at is, at least at the initial stages, it doesn't matter if you call the 800 number, the 988, or the 911, you're going to get a crisis responder. And so just systematizing that to some form of consistency, and then as we move on, we can advertise and publicize. Again, it's going to be dependent on... Is the night you know is the 988 where the dispatch is going to come from? That's going to require some system upgrades and other training and stuff. Or could it be through the Santa Cruz 911 dispatch? Uh, we have some meetings coming up with them to see what those capabilities are. And again, everyone has their their staffing models and stuff that they have to attend to as well. Um, I do like the dispatch model through Santa Cruz 911 as a safety precaution for folks. And again. If the power goes out, we're not using a mobile app to dispatch folks. We have the, the 911 center that can keep this up. And again, mobile crisis response has to be thought of now as part of, in a way, part of the EMS system, the emergency response system. Definitely. That's what's replacing. That's great to hear that there'll be no wrong door. All right. Yeah. 911, 988, 800 number to all work. Uh, last question is, um, is this something that as a community member, if I'm walking down the street and I see someone who's clearly you know, suffering from a mental health crisis, is it, can, can I call the number um, and you know, request that a, a team get out there? And you know, how would we screen those kind of calls to make sure that there, that there is a real need? There is a screening process that'll take place and it might be something that is there a HOPES team member, Healing the Streets team member that's available to go? You know, what level is this crisis at? And again, that's where the call taker has to screen, you know, the call maker to find out what those criteria are. So again, we're looking at how do we weave these things together so we get the right response. Um, and again, the more acuity or the greater the crisis, you know, that's going to peel that team <coughs> off in that direction and potentially hold them up for a while, you know, for 60, 90 minutes or so attending to the crisis. So that lower level um, crisis concern, you know, again, we might be looking at some other teams and how we integrate those into this continuum of services. So there's a lot of different options that I think um, the county implementation approach, I think really addresses all these concerns. Mm -hmm. Great, I mean, I know today, one of the most frustrating things is, is coming across people like that, they so clearly need help and not knowing what to do as a community member. And so just the fact that we'll be able to, to have an, an answer, to have a response, people will, will be able to participate in helping to make our community healthier actively as good citizens is um, it's really exciting and promising. Thank you. Thank you. 
Yeah. Mr. President, first. Yeah, second. thank you, Ms. Morales, uh, Ms. Kern, and Mr. Mr. Russell, on uh, an in-depth uh, presentation. Um, I, it's a complicated but necessary situation. We're uh, ever pressing to, uh, to treat our uh, untreated mental health challenge challenges in Santa Cruz County, and uh, it's everywhere. Um, for many years, the co-occurring uh, health issues and substance abuse have led to homelessness. How do you? Uh, there's usually different percentages of people who are homeless that are in need of mental health assistance. Do you have any number here for Santa Cruz County of that? I'm look over to you. Say it's, uh, I mean, there's varying data. So we have data from point in time count. We have data from community service yeah. providers, et cetera. And I would say it's somewhere around 40% right now, if yeah. you kind of averaged all of those. I remember when we when it was just first discussing this homelessness issue, it was 25 percent, it was 35, and then it's 40 to 50. So that seems about right. Um, but uh, this, I really appreciate this plan. Um, I think it's realistic. You're going to move with what we have and what we can afford as best possible. And uh, I think uh, that what you do, uh, you know, in the follow-up of the pandemic, uh, addressing this in issue strategically is um, very valuable. Um, it's not going to happen overnight. And uh, for the uh, Prop 60, was it 63 or 62, uh, it's 19% of the, the funding, and that's state funding. Is that uh, liable to go up, or is it pretty steady? So Prop 63 is the 1% millionaire tax, and so it, yeah. it you know fluctuates with the economy and yeah. people, people's tax base. So, right. uh, it, you know, again, we, we get two forecasts a year uh, where they do whatever they do to crunch the numbers and try to figure out what that's going to look like for us. And then we adjust our budget accordingly uh, and try to, you know, just, like I said before, have some wiggle room just in case we have an economic downturn and that changes. I think during COVID we expected that. It turned out to kind of go the other direction a little bit and that was helpful. Um, the MHSA is funds um, a, a lot of our services here that the innovation is only 5% of our distribution. Um, the rest of the money goes to uh, prevention and early intervention and community support services. So a lot of our programming, our county um, full service partnership teams, our encompass programs, those are funded also through MHSA. Right. And it's worth noting that the governor has a new plan for MHSA on the table um, that we're watching really closely that might carve 30% of that, uh, of the funds that we would be our allotment or our distribution off into focusing on housing, which would reduce the amount of uh, funds that we'd be able to you know, spend directly on mental health treatment. So we are looking at some of our services now, like you mentioned homelessness, you know, many of our, our in-county clinic uh, clients are experiencing homelessness. We have many more across the county that we work closely with Housing for Health Division under HSD and Dr. Ratner to try to figure out how to uh, make sure we're not missing anybody or any opportunities. But um, the, the way that those funds will be distributed across the community needs will change at some point. So, I just appreciate your inclusive, uh, having the county work with the cities and the educational community and so forth. Um, it's going to be we're going to it's going to be much more successful when we do it all together. So I appreciate Absolutely. that approach. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, we'd like to open it up for the community. Is there any member of the community here that would like to address us on this item? Thank you all for waiting. Yes, good afternoon, members of the board. My name is Ken Thomas. I'm a leader with Communities Organized for Relational Power in Action, otherwise known as COPA. Um, it's a civic organization, COPA is, with member institutions in Monterey and Santa Cruz counties. These institutions consist of um, labor associations, schools, um, healthcare providers, uh, and other nonprofits, and faith communities. We organize and act around um, issues that, and pressures that affect families, such as a lack of affordable housing, health care, and safe communities. Um, how we, we've heard and we've shared stories about uh, the lack of mental health and behavioral health services in the county, um, mostly having to do with minors and persons with, uh, that are unhoused. Um, we at COPA have been advocating for many of the recommendations that are before you um, for the following um, recommendations um, that include um, the um, 
the expansion of the program to 24 seven, the staffing include licensed clinicians and EMTs when possible and uh, use of the 988 number. Uh, we therefore really support the staff recommendation to you as well as the grand jury recommendations, especially uh, revolving the recruitment of staff. Um, we urge you to uh, adopt the item before you and thank you for your patience, bye. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Is there anybody else would like to feel free to step forward? <clears throat> Uh, good afternoon, I'm uh, Mike Beebe. I'm the board president for NAMI in Santa Cruz. And I'd like to uh, first thank the, the County Behavioral Health for all the work they've done in the past. I think they've made huge progress the last two or three years and support the plan that's uh, in front of the board. Uh, the leadership of the county has been really good in this. I think this is a great step forward. Uh, some of the things in the report around the need for uh, additional residential step downs, I think is gonna be a critical element in the future. I don't believe that's currently funded in the plan, but that'll be a next step that's been referred to because uh, we need options for the individuals to go from crisis to step down to uh, uh, wellness. And that's a great step forward, so thank you. Thank you, thanks for waiting also and for your work. Good morning, or excuse me, good afternoon, welcome. Good afternoon, supervisors. Um, thank you for your service. Thank you for your support. Um, also, Carlos and Jason, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm here a, a bit to uh, personalize this, um, so bear with me. Um, my wife, uh, Stacy Smith, and I uh, came here this morning to show our support for the uh, item number 10, the proposal for the Mental Health Services Act Innovation Plan funding the Crisis Now program for Santa Cruz County. Um, Sunday, uh, June 25th would have been Sean's 39th birthday. Um, his 10 year old son, Kellen, has been visiting with us. Um, so we thank Karen, we thank Daniel, we thank James and their staff for the work uh, they've done on this project. Um, the Crisis Now project, um, it's just a starting point. It, this is not the end point. We have from what we've seen in the country, we've got 10 to 20 years ahead of us of dedicated, focused work um, on behavioral health services to get to that ideal crisis system. Um, at this point, this Crisis Now pro it's project is um, based on standards, best practices. It requires our community to be involved and it focuses on the needs of the individual in crisis. It is a fully funded project at this time. And this program will save lives and reduce suffering. May I ask to have a, a bit more time? Thank you. Yes, please. Um, as the roadmap to the ideal crisis system reminds us, it is the responsibility of our community to design and implement a crisis response system that meets our needs, and this project does that. Its objective is, and the vision is that every individual and family with a behavioral health need, including mental health, substance use, intellectual and developmental disorders, receives, they don't have to get, they receive the services they need, <coughs> pardon me, where they are, when they need them, every time they need them for the duration and intensity needed to achieve the best possible outcome for a stable and meaningful life. We will know when we have achieved this ideal system because behavioral health crisis will be rare, brief, and non-recurring. We ask that you approve and authorize the submission of this Mental Health Services Act Innovation Plan to fund this Crisis Now project. Again, thank you all for your service. Thank you for your support. Thank you. Is there anybody else here? Good afternoon, Ms. Murphy, thank you for waiting. 
No, I almost said good morning. Good afternoon, chairman, friend, and members of the board. I'm Lisa Murphy. I'm the <clears throat> deputy city manager for the city of Santa Cruz. I'm here to support your team in their effort to expand the mobile crisis response program. As you know, there's a desperate need in our community for the expansion of this service. The city has recently commenced, uh, commissioned a study to implement a program of our own. And we found through our study that approximately 11% of our law enforcement calls for service could have been diverted. That means no law enforcement uh, needed to engage. That amounts to 9,500 calls for service. That's an average of 26 calls per day. And we know that's just the first point of entry at, on the continuum of, of care. We wholeheartedly support the county's effort. For the city, we will continue to also look at the integrating with, with the county as we look at the lower level responses as Supervisor Koenig brought up. What do you do when you call um, for the individual on the street and what type of lower level non-licensed clinician, possibly EMT, uh, peer support. But we really look forward to integrating and working with our partners at the county to provide and bring this service and expand it as a community, a county-wide program, of which we're just part of the piece of the system. So I thank you and I encourage your support for this program, not just in the five year, but in the, the long term. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else here to address us? Morning thank, or afternoon, thanks for waiting. Good afternoon, Chairman Friend, Board. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. I'm here also to advocate and support the county's efforts in this uh, Crisis Now project. Um, as you can imagine, as a public safety professional, I work with a bunch of other jurisdictions that would benefit from this program. And as you've heard from Direct, uh, Deputy uh, City Manager Murphy, uh, this is a project that we're working on currently as well, um, because I think it not only um, would reduce um, calls for service um, for in, in regards to the fire service for us the consultant found that it would drop at about 13 percent that's a thousand calls per service that we could reallocate to other um, uh, significant emergencies but more importantly it would provide the services needed to these uh, these members of our community that actually need it because let's be honest public safety is not necessarily um, the service that these individuals need so again I just wanted to throw my support behind this and uh, and um, say thank you for the, the support thus far and in the future thank you thank you chief I appreciate it is there anybody else here in chambers that would like to address us um, seeing none is there anybody online Yes, Chair, we do have a speaker online. Call in user one, your microphone's now available. Carolyn <clears throat> Garrett, I'd like to see a presentation of equal time of the problems with this proposal and the problems with telecare. I witnessed a friend being picked up during a so-called wellness check, and it was very violent against her, looked like a military operation. She was forcefully injected, um, and it was not helpful to her at all. I often look at why are we having problems? What are the systemic problems that are causing crisis? <laughs> Fewer people would be in crisis, driven to drugs, were they not living in poverty, unhoused, isolated, hungry, uh, undernourished, and being in toxic environments like pesticides and wireless microwaves. If causes were removed and people had decent living conditions, we would have much fewer um, people in what are called in crisis. And sharing something here from Barry Trower, an expert in microwave radiation, adverse health effects, this relates to what you're talking about. There's a plethora of extensive, well-researched documents from around the world highlighting impairments and illnesses caused by microwave radiation, including mental problems involving depression, irritability, memory loss, difficulty in concentrating, headache, dizziness, suicidal tendencies, 
et cetera, we are inundated with microwave radiation toxicity causing many adverse health effects. In Is there anybody else online? Yes, Chair, we do have another speaker. Thank you. Matthew, your microphone's now available. Thank you. Can you um, I've been on uh, San Francisco Street Crisis Response Team for about two years, and one of the biggest frustrations we have is um, not enough services available. And that's in San Francisco, and they have lots and lots of services. And so this concept of putting the uh, putting the cart before the horse. Um, uh, just to, I hope this program, or it's, I hope it gets funded and started, and everything else. Just something to consider. Um, coming in on coming back to uh, triage and calls for service. Uh, during this meeting, as I was watching online, police showed up to a house across the street for an uh, individual sleeping in the bushes, and she had a can of beer, and she was calm and. Uh, the situation escalated uh, with all due respect to the police officer. Uh, the officer didn't have the training to uh, keep the situation calm. Uh, the woman was arrested. And again, cost for that compared to having a crisis team come out uh, and how triage or how 911 operators can triage those calls, um, I think is very important and something for something to consider. Thank you for your comments. And that's all I have. Well, thank you for your comments. That was our final speaker chair. All right, we'll bring it back to the board for action. Supervisor Cummings. Yeah, I'll um, <clears throat> move approval and authorization of submission of the proposed Mental Health Services Act Innovation Plan to fund Crisis Now for a term of July 1st, 2023 to June 30th, 2026 with an option to extend through June 30th, 2028 pending Mental Health Services Act legislative direction to the Mental Health Services Oversight and Accountability Commission and authorize the Health Services Agency Director or designate to execute related documents required for submission. Second. All right, we have a motion for the recommended actions from Supervisor Cummings, a second from Supervisor Koenig. And? And I just had um, a couple comments. Um, one was that as we continue to develop this, but just moving forward in general, um, based on kind of what we heard from some of our SEIU workers, really trying to make sure that we can figure out how to incentive people, incentivize people to want to work and stay in Santa Cruz um, is going to be one of our top priorities. I mean, we have a lot of people who come to us with great ideas. There's a lot of great programs that we want to implement, but if we don't have the workers here to actually provide those services, then, you know, um, then we're, we're not going to be able to meet our our goals and so um, anything that we can do as board members please let us know um, if there's bills that we need to support let us know so that we can get the funding necessary um, so that we can keep people in our community who are going to help us provide these very necessary services thank you we have a motion and a second if we get a roll call please supervisor Koenig aye Cummings aye Hernandez aye McPherson aye and friend all right, and that passes unanimously. Thank you all for your work. We're gonna take uh, item 13 out of order. I understand that we can, I do think we can get through these items pretty quickly. Item 13 is a public hearing to consider County Service Area 48 and County Service Area 4 for fire protection special benefit assessment charge reports for fiscal year 23-24 and adopt the resolutions confirming said reports for CSA 48-2020, CSA 48 and CSA 4 as outlined in the memo of the Director of General Services. We have the board memo. The CSA 4 and 48 information, the resolutions for approval, the assessment rule, the cover sheet, uh, and the cover sheet. Uh, Mr. Director Beaton, thank you for waiting today. Uh, thank you, Board, uh, uh, Chair Friend. Uh, Michael Beaton, Director of General Services. Uh, with me today is your County Fire and the San Mateo Santa Cruz Cal Fire Unit Chief, uh, Nate Armstrong, and we are available for any questions. Are there any questions in regards to this? Item before we open up the public hearing. I see none, so we'll open up the public hearing. Is there any member of the community that would like to address us on CSA uh, 48 and CSA 4? I see none in chambers. Madam Clerk, is there anybody online for this public hearing? Yes, Chair, we do have speakers online. Charlie, your microphone's now available. Thank you, Supervisors, Chairman Friend. Uh, this is Charlie Eady. I'm speaking on behalf of the homeowner associations at Pajaro Dunes, uh, both of which, uh, you know, have been working closely with the county and Cal Fire over the years on budget details. And I just wanted to um, 
uh, say uh, once again that we appreciate the work that uh, Chief Armstrong and Michael Beaton have done in uh, working with us on the budget and that the, uh, the Joint Committee of the Pajaro Dunes Homeowners Association does support the, uh, the fee as it's proposed and are looking forward to further examining whether there might be opportunities for uh, in improving fire service for power dunes. Thank you. Else online. Call in user one, your microphone's now available. Uh, so many supervisors meeting have benefit assessment, benefit assessment, which means more and more increased taxes. And it just seems like way too much for me and um, questionable what real benefits we get. That's just my observations. Thank you. Else online. We have no further speakers share. Okay, seeing none, I will close the public hearing and bring it back to the board for action. I move the recommended action. Second. We have a motion from Supervisor McPherson and a second from Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chief, for waiting uh, this morning and into the afternoon. If we could have a roll call, please. Certainly, Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Hernandez. Aye. McPherson. Aye. And Friend. Aye, and that passes unanimously. We'll move on or back to item 11, which is to approve the selection of Bruce Harmon as the public artist for the Green Valley Multi-Use Pathway Public Art Project to approve the attached independent contractor agreement with Bruce Harmon for a not to exceed amount of 72,000 and authorize the Director of Parks, Open Space and Cultural Services to sign the agreement to take related actions as outlined in the memo of said director. We have the agenda board memo, uh, the resume, the exhibit that shows the design and the contract effectuated. Uh, director Gaffney, thank you for waiting again and welcome back. Thank you, Chair Friend. Uh, we'd like to quickly and efficiently get to this item. And so to do that, I'm gonna have the chair of our arts commission, Margaret Niven, introduce our artist and the uh, subject. Thank you. <coughs> good afternoon, welcome. Hey, good afternoon. Uh, the Arts Commission is pleased to recommend for your approval today a public art proposal for the Green Valley multi-use pathway. The art selection panel comprised of community members, professional artists, county arts commissioners, and a representative of the involved department met in late March of this year to review the artist's proposals. Two artists were invited to interview with the selection panel on April 24th. The artists were asked to bring detailed drawings or a maquette to further define their pro project proposals. After much deliberation, the panel chose Bruce Harmon to continue in the process. At the May 1st meeting of the Arts Commission, the commission reviewed the panel's decision and we voted to recommend that you approve the selection of Mr. Harmon as the public artist for the Green Valley Multiple Use Pathway. The artwork selected by the panel and recommended by the Arts Commission is original and has artistic merit. The imagery celebrates local agriculture and wildlife and will beautify and enliven the pathway. I'd like now to introduce the artist, Bruce Harmon, who will give you a brief presentation of his proposal and answer any questions you may have. Thank you, and thank you for your work on the commission. Mr. Harmon, thank you for waiting, welcome. Good afternoon, board. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, what you see here is a model of the proposed art installation there will be five of these colorful uh, monoliths placed at intervals along the Green Valley walkway. Each one is about four and a half feet tall and about a foot thick. Um, the images um, will, were derived in part from ancient Mexican motifs found on pottery and stamping tools. The apple and strawberry designs refer to the local farming community while the heron celebrates local wildlife. The flowers take inspiration from Diego Rivera and the bunnies are just goofy. No, wait, they celebrate the power of a loving family. That's what I meant. Uh, the black lines will be in relief about an inch um, above the background. So the image will endure as long as the concrete does. Both sides will have the artwork. So pedestrians and cyclists as well as motorists will see them. The foot wide edges will be decorated with tiles painted by local school kids in consultation with the Pajaro Valley Unified School District. I envision the kids taking some ownership of the art and valuing its place in their lives. The budget includes 130 tiles and costs of materials and firing. 
I will be working with Tom Ralston Concrete for this project to ensure success with the details and the pouring of the concrete. The molds will be built to match the artwork and the monuments will be poured in place on top of prepared foundation slabs. After the concrete is cured, I'll paint the colors with long lasting mural paint and finally coat it with a strong anti-graffiti clear coat. These will be local monuments that endure for many years and can be refreshed with new paint when needed. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. This is exciting. It was absolutely stunning. Um, are there any questions or comments from board members? Uh, please, Supervisor. Yeah, I'll just say I really appreciate um, this item coming towards us and the conceptual design that you've brought to, uh, to our attention. It looks really great, and uh, I can't wait to see when it's unveiled. So thank you. Great. Thank you. Supervisor Hernandez. See if my mic's on. Yes, it is. So I really, you know, I was going to have some comments, but I, I looked at some of the uh, the images, and I really like the the really imagery that's connected to the community as well, from the strawberries, the apples you showed us, the herons, some of the fish there. Um, that's really relevant to just that Green Valley corridor as well as Watsonville and the Greater Pajaro Valley. So thank you for that beautiful images. Great, thank you. Just the contrasting colors for that area is going to really brighten up that pathway. I mean, it, it's, I think it's going to really be a stunning uh, addition. And in particular, I'm a softie for the partnership with the kids. I just think it's going to be so great that that's been done in other parts of, of all of our districts. And it really, I, I've seen kids that they've grown up. In fact, we even have some in our office. We have some photos that were done by Aptos High School students that they've come back years later to look at. And I think that it just becomes part of uh, that relationship. So I appreciate your vision on that. I think it's going to go a long way. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to mention one thing. Um, it was suggested that the five bus stops along the two mile route would be good locations for where these would be placed, maybe to just one side. So that's what my proposal includes. Are there any additional comments before we open it up to the uh, community? Is there anybody from the community that would like to address this on the side of in chambers? Is there anybody online? We have no speakers online, Chair. Okay, we'll bring it back. Uh, Supervisor Hernandez, is there a motion? I'll make the motion to approve this. Is there a second for the recommended actions? Second. We have a second from Supervisor Koenig. If we could have a roll call, please. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Friend? Aye. And that passes unanimously. Congratulations on that, and thank you for waiting. And the final item of the regular agenda is, is item 12, to consider approval of the Measure D five-year plan for 23-24 fiscal year and take related actions as outlined in the memo. <laughs> the Deputy CAO, Director of Community Development of Infrastructure, we have the agenda item of the Measure D five-year plan. And we have uh, Casey Carlson and we have uh, Steve Wiesner here. Um, Mr. Wiesner. Yes. Good morning. good morning, or good afternoon, I should say. The morning went fast. <clears throat> um, quite a day. Uh, yeah, good afternoon, uh, Chair Friend and board members and CAO Palacios and members of the public, those who are still with us. Um, my name is Steve Wiesner, Assistant Director of Community and Development and Infrastructure. And here with me today is Casey Carlson, who um, is our Senior Civil Engineer in Public Works. He's in charge of the county's pavement management system. Um, so Mr. Carlson and I are here today to present your board with a brief, hopefully very brief, Measure D five-year plan update. We do this every year um, about this time. Um, and, and today our presentation will cover a brief history of Measure D, um, our past year's projects, this year's projects is happening right now, and the Measure D five-year plan update that you have before you today. So, oh, thank you. Um, so just as reminders, uh, Measure D is a county-wide uh, half-cent sales tax measure that was passed by voters of our county um, in November of 2016. It's a 30-year funding source for transportation um, projects countywide. County roads revenue um, from this specifically for county-maintained roads is estimated at approximately $4 million a year. Um, and this next year, that's exactly what we estimate. Um, the annual requirements for this plan um, is codified by the RTC, um, includes producing a five-year plan approved in a public hearing by the Board of Supes. So that's why we're here today. We do this every year as, a, as an update to the five-year plan. Um, uh, when Measure D passed uh, within that following year, we did uh, surveys of, the, of the, our communities and the three top priorities for our communities were us to continue to try to maintain and repair county roadways um, by doing neighborhood resurfacing projects and neighborhood safety projects. 
Okay, so just very quickly, I'm gonna go over. So we've had five years of this program. It's been wildly successful. We've put out a project every single year since, uh, since Measure D was passed, um, starting with 2018, um, and then last year's project in 2022, and we're actively working on the project this year as well. Um, so just as a quick reminder for District 1, we started up in the Summit area, um, and we did uh, Miller Hill, Miller, Miller Cutoff area. The following year in 2019, we moved down to Live Oak. We did many ro roads in the Live Oak area. Um, in 2020, found us up in the Thurber area, um, Santa Cruz Gardens area. And in 2021, um, we focused some of our efforts down in SoCal. Um, and in 2022, we went back to the Thurber area and completed Thurber Road. Um, and then we also did quite a substantial project on Portola Drive too as well. District two um, in 2018 saw us beginning uh, with the Measure D program in La Selva, moving on to Rio Del Mar in 2019, and then on to the Sea Cliff area in 2020. Um, we were able to complete a few roads in Coralitos area in 21. And last year we went back to the Rio Del Mar area and also um, in, in some areas off of Soquel Drive in the Carrillo College area. Um, District three, um, doesn't take in quite as much money, so it takes a little bit longer to build up funds to do meaningful projects. Um, but in 2018 and 19, we did half of Martin Road in 18, the other half in, in, in 19. And we are currently banking uh, District 3's money towards a large rehabilitation project on Swanton Road. In District 4, um, we began by replacing a pretty critical bridge out on Casserly Road, um, which was sinking into the mud. We didn't have any other funding sources for that bridge at the time. Um, so we did that as the first project. And then 2019 and 2020, we were able to complete Lakeview Drive. We did again half the road in 2019 and the other half in 2020. And we are um, this year, um, we're banking, the next year saw us banking towards Paulson Road, um, which we're actually actively doing right now. Um, and District 5, again, we started up in, uh, in 2018 up in Boulder Creek. 2019 moved down to Ben Loman. And you can see just by looking at the pictures, I mean, these projects make quite a difference for our neighborhoods. I mean, just think about curbside appeal and quality of life to have your road looking the way it does on the bottom compared to what they look like on the top. I mean, these neighborhoods really appreciate these projects. Um, and so we, we did, we marched from Boulder Creek down to Ben Loman and into Felton. Um, and then we're back up in Boulder Creek and we're kind of spreading out further from the town core there. And um, last year saw us again in Ben Loman. So there is a theme here. We're trying to hit our neighborhoods as much as we possibly can. Um, this is an area that the county wasn't able to address in, the, in a couple decades before that. Um, we've been doing pretty well on our arterials and major collectors, but, but the neighborhood roads were really taking, taking a beating. Okay, so this year you'll see our project is active. We're out there in the neighborhoods all over countywide. And, um, and um, in, in District 1, um, we're actually being opportunists here uh, with a sanitary line that's getting replaced by the sanitation district. We're gonna follow up by completely repaving and restriping um, East Cliff Drive from around 13th up to 26th. At District 2, um, we're back in the Sea Cliff neighborhood and you can see we're starting to do areas west of State Park and a, and a couple areas east of State Park as well, completing roads that we hadn't done in the previous year. <clears throat> District three, we are banking funds for a very substantial future rehabilitation of Swanton Road. And district four, we're actually actively out there. We're doing work on Paulson Road that we'd been banking for for a couple of years. Um, and we're, out, we're able to hit parts of Green Valley Road as well, which will be a nice supplement to the, to the path project that we're embarking on this summer. Um, and, and in District 5, we're back down in the Felton area, and you can see we're doing roads that, again, um, roads that we weren't able to hit our first time around in Felton, and so we're starting to work our way out, out from the town core, um, which is really great to see. Um, all these areas are really starting to get facelifts, and you can really see it if you visit them. Okay, so what you have before you today is the update to our five-year plan. Again, we bring this every year. We don't always add roads every year. And I will say just, I will note that the last time we added roads, I think was 2020. We added a significant amount of roads in 2020. We don't wanna bite off more than we can chew in a five year plan. Um, and it's really hard to say four or five years now what the cost of these projects are gonna be. And so we try to bring modest um, recommendations to your board such that we create expectations with our community that we can see these projects actually come to fruition. Um, so that's why you'll see us banking money in these districts, right? Um, and so next year, so what you'll have, what you'll see in the plan that you have before you, if you'll look, 
Um, we telegraph that in green. I think that you'll see that it's highlighted in green on your plan, what we intend to do next year in each district. And so we just have a countywide map here, um, which shows uh, what we're gonna do in each supervisor district. And so in district one, um, this was a commitment made many years ago when we started applying for grants for the rail trail. Um, we're keeping that commitment in district one's um, allotment for next year's funding is gonna go towards segment nine of the rail trail. Um, that's matched a very large grant, like a 30 million plus dollar grant there. So we're leveraging that money up. Um, district two, um, we did add a few roads to district two this year and working with the supervisor's office. Um, but it looks like the best opportunity for us next year is gonna be to go after Trout Gulch Road, which is fantastic because we're doing tons of storm damage repairs up there this summer. So we're hoping that all of that'll be done. And by the time we get out there next year, um, we'll be able to resurface all of Trout Gulch um, in its entirety. That I think road has been on the plan for at least a couple, three to five years, right? So we've, that one's been a long time coming. Um, we're excited about that. Uh, District three, we're still banking towards a future Swanton project, which I think we plan to do. And Casey, could you remind me, is it 25 or 26? It's, I think 25 is when we think we'll have enough money, but we'll continue to you know, work with, with the super district office to let them know when that project's gonna come forward, but I think that's a 25 project. And then in District 4, um, we're beginning to bank money towards Murphy's Crossing. So you know, we're, we're spending all of the bank account that we have this year on Paulson and Green Valley, and we'll start to bank towards Murphy's Crossing, and I think right now 26 is our outlook on that project. Um, and then up in District 5, we're recommending um, to do some more neighborhood work, uh, which have been on the plan for many years now, um, continuing on in the Felton area, and then just the unincorporated areas of uh, just the outskirts of Scotts Valley, which the county is responsible for. Okay, so with that, uh, the recommended actions here are to adopt the attached Measure D five-year plan for fiscal year 23-24. Um, and to authorize Public Works to submit a copy of the approved board package to the Santa Cruz Regional Transportation Commission. So hopefully that was brief enough for you all. Was out, it was outstanding. Are there other are questions from board members? The Supervisor Hernandez, do you have any comments or questions? Well, I'm just really excited that we're banking that money on Murphy Road. You know, I get a lot of requests for that road. Uh, and of course, uh, Green Valley Paulson as, as well. Um, you know, one of the things that we've been uh, looking at in our office is looking at different counties and, and the way uh, roads are funded besides just uh, road miles, right? And so putting equity into the, into the criteria. Um, and so, I mean, looking at uh, things like also things, factors like how many young people live in the area, uh, socio equity, economic factors into the area. So more of those type of demographics they have to do more with equity. And so there's different uh, counties that are looking at this and transitioning over to, to a different formula that takes um, equity into, into the formula as well. Uh, for a lot of the communities that are, uh, have been uh, not necessarily uh, invested in or, or you know, have been neglected in, in a sense. So, uh, be you know interesting to look at that see what other communities are doing uh, to uh, in terms of uh, funding roads uh, the cr the criteria for funding roads in the future but for for the next five years I think I'm happy with the projects that are lined up and the ones that are happening right now as well um, but I think we have to have a, a, a more of a systemic approach uh, to equity as well. Uh, I mean, the projects that we have lined up is good, but we have to have a systemic approach as well within the county that's institutionalized. So thank you. Thank you. But I'll make the motion as well. <laughs> so, Supervisor um, Cummings, please. Thank you for that presentation. And um, you actually answered a bunch of the questions I had around timing. And that's going to be really helpful as we're trying to share out, you know, what we're taking action on today and letting people know kind of where things are at as it relates to uh, roads being repaired. My one question, because you know, a lot of these are larger projects, obviously like repairing all of Swanton Road, makes sense that's gonna take a lot of funding and time. In terms of the kind of smaller repairs that come up along the way, um, I guess how does that fit within the funding? I mean, as a new supervisor, I know that during the uh, storms, you know, we were able to reach out to your office and thank you so much for being so responsive. But as, you know, issues come up along the way, I'm just curious how that kind of fits into this overall plan of, of road repair throughout the county. 
That's a great question. Um, so what we've been trying to do with Measure D is really improve, improve these roads and do capital improvements. Um, for the basic maintenance stuff that we have out there, requests like uh, could be a pothole here or it could be like, hey, there's a major area of this road that needs a repair. Um, but we use our regular maintenance funding program for that, and that's largely paid for through gas taxes. So I would say to the extent that those requests come to you, please forward those on to us and we can see whether they're on the horizon in our maintenance program currently, um, which we're pretty active with our basic maintenance between April and October. We have a regular program. Um, and, and if it's not, then we can look to schedule it in a future, future year. Thank you. Yeah. Those are all my questions. Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to add my appreciation uh, to the roads team that um, when we're doing these resurfacings, we're also looking at every opportunity to improve uh, safety for bikes and pedestrians. So on Thurber Lane, uh, we extended the bike lane quite significantly there, uh, added some great green paint that I know is much appreciated by the community, and of course the same on Portola Drive as well. Um, so I just really appreciate that collaboration. Thank you, and I appreciate you noting that we do try to make any other improvements that can be done in association with all of the res resurfacing projects. Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just want to go back to 2016 and thank the voters of Santa Cruz County by two thirds plus approving Measure D, uh, and especially in light of the catastrophes we've had in the recent years. I don't know what we'd do without this for matching grants, for what we want to do. And so I, I just want to reiterate that was a huge lift and uh, the voters responded and we're really thankful for that. And I'm, I'm really appreciative of you, Mr. Wiesner. Uh, I've, you've known, uh, we've all give you a call here and there and uh, boom, you, you get on it. I mean, it might be, like you said, these were major road projects and I'm really glad to see that there's a focus on the 5th District and Felton and uh, unincorporated Scotts Valley this year. Uh, but uh, you get at it, and if it needs to be addressed, and it's a serious pothole, shall we say, uh, it seems like it's, it's patched within a week. And uh, I, I think um, I get as many calls on road repair needs and so forth from our constituents as anything. If they want to see what our plan of attack is that you have presented, uh, where would they, where would you say we could say, this is where you should go to see what's going to be done this year or next? Well, thank you for mentioning that. Um, shameless plug for our um, website, which actually was stood up in the last couple of years. Is, right. uh, tell me if I'm wrong. It's sccroads.org. Um, Did I get that right? So we have on our DPW website, there's a page, um, yeah. SB1 and Measure D, and the five-year plan is posted there. Um, the sccroads.org is one we unrolled this year, and that's for current projects. So anything that we're doing this like the summer would be posted there, but the, the five-year plan would be on our website for the Measure D and SB1. And, and I think the general thought is uh, you try to spread it throughout the county, but with those most heavily traveled that uh, get the most attention uh, uh, as, as much as possible uh, that you can do. And uh, just seeing from what, you, what, you've, what we have accomplished in the county is uh, truly remarkable under the circumstances we've had to face in the last few years. So thank you again. Thank you. I'll make brief comments that it shows that when the funding is provided, you can do remarkable work. I mean, the Measure D road work that's been done is of sort of all of the projects that come to the county, the ones that are generally done, uh, actually, in some cases, even under budget on time, which is one of the reasons why we can expand projects. And I think a lot of that deals, Casey, on your side of the house with the fact that you really are doing a good job in advance of analyzing the roads, the costs, and really trying to find that component. And to the equity component, I mean, we, we need, there, we're one of the rare counties where most of the counties in the unincorporated area and people need these roads fixed. It's been over 60 years. And so one definition of equity is ensuring that roads that haven't been touched for 60 years actually get touched. Um, we have a couple of colleagues here. I mean, obviously that serve mainly cities, but in the unincorporated area where most of, uh, where most of the people live in our county, I think that they want to ensure that that money uh, is going to as many roads as possible, as quickly as possible. And we've done a good job, I think, uh, both as a board and as, as Public Works has ensuring that that's the case. Um, Mr. Chair, could I just make one other point? When the passage of Measure D, we became a so-called self-help county. And I don't know how you can, can you put it in dollars and cents, how much that has meant to this county? I mean, we raise so much per year, I think you said $4 million, but the state buys into it if you're a self-help county. How much does that help? It does. We get an additional amount of SB1 funds just because of that. Um, and I think it's in the neighborhood of around a half a million. 
um, but also I think it really helps us compete for statewide grants and also for federal grants because it shows a partnership within our region. And um, it's really hard to put a dollar sign on that, but we've won hundreds of millions of dollars worth of grant money for our county, for transportation systems within our county, just in the last couple of years. And I think SB1, or excuse me, I think Measure D has a lot to do with that. So we are also too grateful for the, for the voters of passing this in 2016, and of course for your board support as well. Thank you, I'd like to open it up for the community. Is there any member of the community who'd like to address us on the Measure D program? Thank you for waiting. My pleasure. Uh, chair, friend, and members of the board, my name's Matt Farrell, as you all probably know by now. Um, I'm chair of Friends of the Rail and Trail, and uh, we also are deeply grateful to the voters who supported Measure D in 2016 because uh, that has helped move forward the rail and trail project. And I'm here today to speak in favor of uh, the allocation for segment nine that's in the, in the budget that's proposed this year, in this report. And uh, also want to uh, congratulate the Public Works Department for its wisdom in hiring Casey Carlson. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Farrell. Uh, good afternoon, welcome back. Good afternoon, um, I wasn't gonna speak, but I have a meeting at one, um, so I heard your presentation. My name's Olivia Martinez, I'm the Region 2 Director for SEIU. Um, I think the only thing that I would emphasize is the importance of workers, right? Without the workers, you cannot do this work. The last the report that I saw, I think Public Works had a vacancy of about 20 positions, not sure if that's updated. I think it's important that Public Works does everything possible to recruit um, because during the storms, we had a lot of problems with workers work, working over 13 hours, right, of overtime. That's a health and safety issues for workers. Some of our workers got um, injured, and I think it's important that um, the same way that you're doing outreach to promote Measure D, that you promote what you're doing and recruit new people. Um, because you're short staff, and it means that workers are overworked. So thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else in, the, in chambers? Is there anybody online? Yes, Chair, we do have a speaker online. Call and use your two, your microphone's now available. Caroline, Karen, sounds like some important road work is getting accomplished here. And I would like to help promote safe roads by having the dangerous microwave radar signs telling your speed removed. Those are a health hazard. And I have a question. You said this is money um, funding for transportation. Highway one is really hazardous with what is being done to make narrow lanes. I witnessed a horrible aftermath of, of a collision. I won't go into details, but what is being done to direct the traffic, narrow the access of cars. There's no place to pull over to the side on certain segments if you need to do that. It's pretty terrifying. What I think there needs to be a halt to what's going on or to assure that it's safe. I don't know if there have been deaths in these collisions, but the way it has been altered, I think there's gonna be more collisions and you know, regretfully, it seems like deaths from what they're doing. Also, the massive clear cutting of trees by the freeway there is just horrific. Um, that's no improvement that I see taking place or on the horizon on Highway 1. Is this in your jurisdiction? Could you comment on that? Thank you. 
Thank you. Are there any other, other speakers online? Okay, seeing none, we'll bring it back to the board for action. Supervisor Hernandez, you wanted to make a motion? I'll make the motion to move the item. Second. We have a motion from Supervisor Hernandez, a second from Supervisor Cummings for the recommended actions. We get a roll call, please. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Friend? All right, and that passes unanimously. Thank you for all of your work. Um, we do have a closed session item. Council, is there anything anticipated to be reportable? No. All right, that will end the open session portion. Thank you.